Up next, we'll bring you coverage of a hearing held by the House Energy and Commerce Subcommittee on Telecommunications and Finance to examine competition in the cable industry, as well as the issue of telephone company entry into cable television. Congressman Edward Markey of Massachusetts chairs the panel, which hears testimony from representatives of the cable industry and telephone companies. Good morning. Today the subcommittee will continue with the second in a series of legislative hearings concerning the cable television industry. At today's hearing we will focus on competition in the video marketplace. In preparing for today's hearing, I had the opportunity to read testimony that I would like to share with you. Quote, Last fall, the FCC authorized direct broadcast satellite service. DBS will provide multiple channels of programming beamed directly from satellites to parabolic antennae on rooftops on homes all across the country. So far, 10 companies are working on providing TBS. And the first signals direct to homes from outer space could start later this year." Unquote. That testimony is not from one of today's witnesses, but actually is from testimony presented before the subcommittee almost seven years ago, on May 25, 1983. Clearly, in 1984, when the Congress passed the Cable Act, we expected technologies, including direct broadcast satellite, wireless cable, and private cable to compete with cable for the consumer's dollar. Unfortunately, as I have stated in the past, waiting for competition in the cable industry has been like waiting for Godot. Although a fully competitive video marketplace has not developed, as witnesses will testify later this morning, virtually every video transmission technology has improved. Wireless cable has improved its technological capabilities. And the FCC is looking to find ways to make wireless cable an even stronger competitive competitor. Similarly, home satellite technology has improved greatly. As you can see, inside our hearing room, we have a six-foot dish. And parked right outside in the Rayburn Horseshoe is a state-of-the-art 10-foot parabolic satellite dish that provides consumers increased channel capacity and improved picture clarity over earlier generation dishes which measured up, measured up to 30 feet in size. The small 16-inch square dish on the table uh, that uh, we will uh, place this uh, in the course of the, uh, of the hearing uh, represents the next leap in technology. This dish is a prototype of the dishes that will be used for reception of sky, chable, sky uh, cables proposed K-band DBS service. The dishes are expected to be available for purchase for approximately $300 by 1993 or 94 when sky, channel, uh, sky uh, cable is available. As you can probably imagine, one uh, the older technology requires almost a zoning variance uh, in order to enjoy the benefits of the video revolution. This, on the other hand, uh, will make it possible for you to put your uh, satellite uh, dish uh, in between your petunias uh, and to not cause the uh, great uh, offense which uh, some people now consider the present state of technology uh, as it presents to neighborhoods. And fiber optics have made the vision of broadband integrated networks an imminent reality. The telcos and other proponents of fiber optics assert that fiber will allow literally unlimited capacity for video transmission, including high definition television. And many hold out the hope that the telephone companies will provide the long sought competition to cable operators. As the subcommittee considers legislation on cable television, 
My goal is to ensure that the competitive landscape that we thought existed or soon would exist back in 1984 becomes a reality. As we learned from our experience in the last six years, however, achieving this competitive marketplace is not an easy task. In order to ensure that the past does not become prologue, we must wrestle with two of the same questions we attempted to answer six years ago. What regulatory and market policies can we establish that will promote the emergence of a competitive marketplace? And what actions can we take to expedite its development? I fully expect that the witnesses joining us today will lead us towards answers to these difficult questions. And we, before we begin the uh, hearing, I would like to thank uh, Davis Satellites, which is a company out in Waldorf, uh, Maryland, owned by uh, Buddy Davis, who provided us with the satellite dishes that are in our hearing room and uh, out on the, um, uh, the area immediately in front of the Rayburn building. Uh, for helping us to see how the changes are occurring in this uh, satellite dish uh, industry. And I, I thank him very much for the extraordinary effort that he put in in making uh, sure that uh, Davis Satellites could help us here today. Uh, with that, my time for <coughs> opening statements has expired, and I turn to recognize the ranking minority member of the subcommittee, the gentleman from New Jersey, Mr. Ronaldo. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, I'm pleased that the subcommittee is holding a hearing on cable television this morning because it's a subject that many members of this committee on both sides of the aisle have wanted to address for some time. The cable industry has grown from infant to adult in record time. Six out of ten households currently subscribe to cable. The industry's growing pains are now under a microscope in Congress. As in many cases, rates have increased dramatically and customer service has declined. In any industry, the rise of a new competitor generally triggers a reaction. Existing players, for example, try to knock the new kid on the block down a peg or two, and others try to get in on the game. This is now happening to cable. Broadcasters generally and regularly complain about cable's power, and telephone companies want a piece of the action. It seems that those who want to compete with cable have part of the battle won already. Everyone is in agreement that competition to cable would keep rates down, quality of service up, and increase the variety of programming. For the first time, advances in technology from fiber optics to K-band satellites make competition to cable widely attainable. Wireless cable. The new investors in DBS and telephone companies all deserve credit for their efforts in trying to make cable competition a reality. But I think there's a long way to go before the specific terms of competition are fleshed out. Unfettered cable competition, in my opinion, won't be a reality until Congress figures out how to ensure that vastly different technologies with different public interest responsibilities can compete fairly in the delivery of video programming to the home. It's a job that at first blush looks relatively easy, but soon it becomes like quicksand. The farther you walk, the deeper you get, and the less chance you have to get out safely. We want to bridge that gap in whatever way will bring the greatest choice for subscribers at the lowest possible cost. And that should be our fundamental consideration. With that in mind, I've instructed the staff to draw up policy and legislative options on cable, cable issues that I intend to evaluate. Then I'll make a decision on the best approach to take on the entire range of cable issues, from re-regulation, competition, must carry, and so forth. One thing is certain. This subcommittee's goal in resolving competitive issues remains constant. We want to provide as many freedoms to compete as possible, but we can't do that job without making hard choices. Those choices can be made only if we can see clearly the promise and advantages, as well as the pitfalls and disadvantages mm -hmm. of every possible course of action. To give the subcommittee that clear view, Existing and would-be competitors must do more than just tell us generally what they want. 
they also must specifically address the harder issues of how they should be permitted to compete before they can expect any type of legislative relief. With that in mind, Mr. Chairman, I look forward to the testimony of our witnesses, and I hope we can engage in receive testimony that will put us on the road to sorting out the many thorny problems with increasing competition to existing cable systems. I yield back the balance of my time. I thank the gentleman from New Jersey. The gentleman's time has expired. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Oklahoma, Mr. Sinar. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Ohio, Mr. Eckert. Mr. Chairman, thank you very much. I, uh, I guess it's not lost upon me and some, uh, some in this room that there are a number of members of this committee uh, who spent a career trying to get out of this room, uh, and now we find ourselves back in it. Uh, notwithstanding that, Mr. Chairman, uh, you, and particularly the gentleman from Virginia, Mr. Boucher, have, uh, have invested a lot of time in, in bringing this, this, this issue to us. Uh, I would just briefly express some concern that uh, uh, the imposition of uh, one form of monopoly to bring competition to another may not, uh, may not be this gentleman's uh, pre preferred, uh, preferred option. Uh, but, uh, but frankly, I think uh, uh, the options uh, that the Boucher legislation suggests uh, uh, are somewhat refreshing in this debate. As you know, privately, Mr. Chairman, uh, and, and certainly publicly, uh, I have been uh, now urging uh, this committee to move forward in, in the arena of, of, of cable legislation. Exactly how that happens is not yet clear to me. My colleague from Louisiana has been uh, speaking eloquently about multi-channel uh, source of programming, programming services. I certainly uh, uh, would, would like to entertain that, uh, uh, that option as well. So I welcome this, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I'm thankful for you and the gentleman from Virginia's efforts and uh, look forward to, uh, to the witnesses and their, uh, their comments. Thank the gentleman. The gentleman's time has expired. The chair recognizes the gentleman from uh, Texas, uh, Mr. Fields. And I want to thank you for dedicating uh, one panel today uh, to telephone company entry into cable. Uh, first of all, I want to welcome one of our witnesses today, uh, Bob Brown, who is uh, president of Sugarland Telephone Company, which is based in Sugarland, Texas, which is just southeast of Houston. Uh, Sugarland Telephone is a relatively small telephone company that is carrying out some very big ideas. Uh, besides being a very significant player in international telecommunications, Sugarland is doing what cynics and critics say telephone companies have no intention of doing, and that is it's running fiber optics through the residential areas of Sugarland, a very fast-growing area uh, in metropolitan Houston. And it's my hope that this committee will act to allow Bob Brown and others like uh, Mr. Brown to provide more than just voice telephone over that fiber. Mr. Chairman, this subcommittee has held a lot of hearings on cable since the passage of the 1984 Cable Deregulation Act, but I don't think any of those hearings have been as important as this hearing today. For the first time, it seems that the subcommittee will be permitted to focus on an industry that appears capable of and willing to provide cable service to virtually every home in this country, and that's the telephone industry. And I've been an advocate and supporter of the cable industry during my time in Congress. In fact, I co-sponsored the Cable Deregulation Act of 1984, and I think it's easy for everyone to admit that cable has brought America the quality programming of sports, news, and classic movies that others have been unwilling or have been unable to provide. In 1984, the cable industry told Congress that we should deregulate in anticipation of competition. Uh, deregulation promised to bring consumers such services as multiple choices for their non-broadcast television, competing cable systems, several providers of programming to affordable rooftop dishes, and backyard dishes free to pull unscrambled signals from the airwaves. Unfortunately, None of that really exists today. I know that a group of corporations, including at least one cable company, promises us a DBS service called Sky Cable, and I really hope that that evolves, because that would give more consumer choice. But we are told that such services would be commonplace in the decades of the 80s, and it just didn't happen. And with all of the many wonderful things that cable has provided, one thing that has not evolved is competition. 
And I still believe in deregulation, but I think we must have competition. It's become clear that the only entity that can effectively provide that competi competition and make it available to all consumers is a local telephone company. And I don't know what useful purpose the current ban on telephone company entry into cable serves. Bob Brown of Sugarland, Texas has been ready, willing, and able to provide cable services to all of the residents of Sugarland, and I've yet to hear a legitimate reason why he should not be able to do so. He's not just talking about deploying fiber optics up and down the streets of Sugarland. He is already doing that. And Mr. Chairman, I've co-sponsored a bill, H.R. 2437, with Congressman Boucher, Cooper, Bruce, Ritter, and the late Congressman Mickey Leland, that with appropriate safeguards, such as safeguards against cross-subsidy, would allow telephone companies to bring cable service and cable price competition to consumers. Telephone entry into cable will not only provide competition, it will rapidly speed deployment of fiber optics to the home and provide incentives for the development of more of the kind of programming which makes cable a special and important part of American life. And I believe that this approach, the competitive approach, Makes more, assent, makes more sense than re-regulation of cable. And I hope that's an approach that this committee will not consider. Mr. Chairman, again, I've yet to hear a compelling reason why Sugarland and other telephone companies should continue to be locked out of the cable business and look forward to the testimony that we'll receive today. Thank you. The gentleman's time has expired. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Virginia, Mr. Bauscher. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Our purpose here today is to examine the appropriateness of competition as the preferred means of addressing the problems that arise from cable television's unregulated monopoly status. During the last hearing that this subcommittee had on this question, uh, my sense was that there was general agreement among the witnesses and the members that the preferred means of addressing these problems is in fact competition. But there is serious disagreement as to what effective competition means. In the opinion of some spokesmen from the cable industry, the availability of a motion picture theater or a local video rental store, or perhaps just uh, having a couple of broadcast stations over the air in a particular locality could constitute effective competition to the local cable monopoly. I think few people who are seriously concerned about ensuring that the television consuming public has access to a wide array of television programs at a fair price, take that view very seriously. Still others contend that true competition can arise from cable overbills, where a second cable company seeks to go into direct comp competition with the current franchise holder. Others say that competition can arise from MMDS, that's generally referred to as wireless cable, from direct broadcast satellite, or from the TVRO market of backyard satellite dish owners. I would suggest that none of these offerings, either individually or in combination, presently provide, or in the future can be expected to provide, effective competition to cable. Let me take just a minute to examine each one of those technologies in turn. Cable overbills today are very rare. In fact, they exist in only a handful of localities nationwide. Where they exist, cable rates tend to be about one-half the national average, and that confirms the appropriateness of competition as the most effective means of addressing problems associated with cable rates. But the barriers to overbuilding are virtually insurmountable. Initially, no cable company wants to risk retaliation by overbuilding an existing franchise. If Company A begins to compete with Company B in Jonesville, then Company B, also possessing cable properties elsewhere, as does Cable A, will begin to overbuild Company A's franchise in Smithville. The industry learned a long time ago that vast profits can be reaped by carving up territory and eliminating all internal competition. And that's the status quo today. In some states, legislation has made overbuilding very costly and most difficult. Another major barrier arises from the vertically integrated nature of the cable industry, where the same companies that own the means of distribution for cable signals also either own or control cable programming. 
And that gives the industry the very convenient ability to deny premier programs to any potential competitor, including an overbuilder. So it's little wonder that overbuilding is indeed a rare phenomenon. Nor has wireless cable gained a secure place in the market. It has the inherent technical limitation of being a line of sight technology. So if you have a large building or a large tree in between the transmitter uh, and the home or business where the television set is located, an unacceptably poor signal can uh, result. Wireless cable also has had severe problems in gaining access to cable affiliated programming. And it's my understanding that we'll have a witness here today who will testify to that uh, disability. Direct broadcast satellite has uh, long been promised as the technology for cable competition. That's been true for nearly a decade. As the chairman indicated in his opening statement, before this very subcommittee in 1983, the president of the NCTA promised that direct broadcast satellite would be providing uh, effective competition for the cable industry within the course of a year, by 1984. Here it is, 1990, and not a single system has been deployed to date. The two systems that are currently being proposed, K-Prime and Sky Cable, uh, are, in my view, years away from operational status. And in view of their affiliation with cable MSOs, I think it's very doubtful that they're going to make their signals available in areas that are presently served by cable companies. History teaches us that the cable industry simply does not compete internally. So the safest bet is that if K-Prime and Sky Cable are in fact uh, able to attain operational status, that their signals will be sold only in areas not currently served by cable, such as rural America and Capitol Hill. <laughs> Backyard dish owners who are generally found only where cable is not available have also experienced severe problems in getting cable affiliated programming at a fair price. And mostly for that reason, that market has never been fully realized. In fact, the only real source of effective competition for the cable industry is the nation's telephone industry. And I think it's time that Congress acknowledge that fact and facilitate the entry of telcos into the cable TV market. H.R. 2437, which I'm pleased to be sponsoring with our colleague from Illinois, Ed Madigan, and 75 other members of the House, would modify the cross-ownership restrictions contained in the 1984 Cable Act and set the conditions under which telephone companies could begin to offer cable television service. The bill has been endorsed by a large number of organizations, including, uh, unsurprisingly, the U.S. Telephone Association, the Communication Workers of America, the National League of Cities, the U.S. Conference of Mayors, Paramount Pictures Incorporated, the Satellite Broadcasting Network, the National Rural Telecommunications Cooperative, the Satellite Dealers Communication Association, the American Home Satellite Association, and the Public Service Group Opt-in America. The American Motion Picture Association has also filed comments with the FCC that, while not specifically endorsing H.R. 2437, do endorse its principal components. And I think it's fair to say that program producers see enormous benefits in having legislation such as this enacted. I sense, uh, Mr. Chairman, a determination among the members of this committee, as well as in the other body, to respond to the problems of high cable rates and poor cable service by passing legislation during the course of this Congress. The choice of some is merely to empower government to establish cable rates. That solution only addresses part of the problem and does so in an inefficient way. The better choice is to foster competition through which the market will set cable rates, ensure that service quality is enhanced, and make available additional viewing options that consumers don't have today. You don't get those benefits through mere rate regulation. If telephone companies are permitted to provide competition, we can also hasten the day when a broadband switched fiber optic network is made available nationwide bringing a wide array of information services as well as television into American homes and businesses, and modernizing the national telecommunications infrastructure in a way that carries some very favorable national economic implications. H.R. 2437 is a comprehensive measure 
It not only allows telephone companies to offer the service, but it sets the terms and conditions for access to programming and requirements that those who provide cable service make their facilities available to potential competitors as well. I would commend the measure to this subcommittee's consideration, and Mr. Chairman, I'll join with you and the other members in welcoming the comments of our panel of witnesses this morning. I thank the gentleman very much for his uh, excellent opening statement, and uh, his time has now expired. We turn mm. to recognize now the uh, gentleman from Colorado, Mr. Schaefer, for an opening statement. I uh, thank the chairman. Now that the business of the full committee is complete, and that's i.e. the uh, Clean Air Bill, we can once again focus our attention on the telecommunications issues. Before we do, let me commend the uh, cable industry and supporters of the MFJ for their un unrelenting commitment to a safe environment. I know of no two other groups, either industry or environmentally, which were as interested in seeing the committee carefully and methodically consider each and every detail of the Clean Air Bill. But with all good things, it must come to an end. And so now Congress is going to turn attention to other issues. So it is that we continue these hearings on how to significantly amend legislation which is yielding its intended results, the 1984 Cable Act. As we discovered at our last session, increases in cable rates have settled to a point somewhere below the consumer price index. The average subscriber can still receive 30 or more channels of diverse programming for about 49 cents a day. As a result, cable subscriptions continue to rise by 15% for the period under study now by the GAO. This at a time when competition for the entertainment dollar of the American public is at an all-time high. It's clear cable competitors go well beyond television, literally from ballet to baseball. But looking at competition within the industry tells us a great deal about technology and the marketplace. The number of independent television broadcasters has more than tripled. VCR penetration increased at a faster rate than cable from 1.1 million in 1979 to nearly 60 million just 10 years later. Home satellite dishes have grown from less than 800,000 to over 2.5 million today. In under three years, 26 MMDS systems have come into operation with 30 more yet to be licensed. These developments are notable, but perhaps the greatest competition to cable the marketplace has to offer is literally just over the horizon. DBS Ventures, including the well-financed Sky Cable, threatened no less than making existing cable systems obsolete. By 1993, the consumer may be able to receive over 100 channels from reasonably priced napkin-sized dishes. The target of the venture, according to a Sky Cable spokesman, is, and I quote, any operator who hopes to remain the sole supplier to his market. One look at the partners from GM to NBC is a good indication of just how serious they are. Simply stated, the current system is working. Competition within industry is rampant and continually growing. But as we are learning from the MFJ debate, more players in the market does not necessarily mean more diversity. Rather, permitting those with an inherent advantage to compete could well mean just the opposite. This is true for the cable as it is for all other information services. Mr. Chairman, you have expressed your commitment to moving cable legislation forward. I would ask that we do it cautiously, keeping in mind the dynamic nature of the industry. Each shift in the debate, whether a result of technology or an action by the FFC, should be considered accordingly. And most of all, we should remember that while emotions and rhetoric make good headlines, they make lousy legislation. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Appreciate it. Gentlemen's time has expired. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Louisiana, Mr. Tozin. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, uh, at the last meeting of this subcommittee on this issue, uh, I was ill in bed. With my channel changer in hand, I watched this committee function. I listened to the witnesses. And every now and then, I'd switch off when I got bored. One of those switches took me to the local Fairfax uh, channel which was also covering a public affairs event, meeting of the Fairfax uh, County Chair, uh, Council rather. And ironically, as Mr. Boucher and other friends of competition in this industry, 
We're debating with witnesses uh, the elements of fair competition for cable. A citizen was appearing before the Fairfax Council to complain about cable rates and cable terms and cable treatment. The uh, city council uh, chairman responded, sir, we'd love to help you, but you better write your congressman because Congress took away our authority to help you when it deregulated the cable. Man and woman, did we in fact deregulate a monopoly? Is there fair competition? Is there any competition? We'll hear some good arguments about it. But you won't convince that citizen standing before the Fairfax Council, or my daddy in Chack Bay who gave up his cable because he didn't like the terms, and the price increases, the changes in his low tier, uh, that there is in fact some real competition for him. Because you see, when Dad asked me what else he could do, and I told him, well, you can always buy a, a satellite dish, he said, how much that cost? I said, well, it's a little expensive still. Can I get programming from somebody other than the cable? I said, well, unfortunately, Dad, you can't. I fought to try to get you that right. We lost, by, I think, one vote on this subcommittee. I fought to try to make sure there were third-party packages of programs available for you if you would invest in a satellite dish at your home. And we didn't succeed. We lost that vote. Ironically, we got one contract out of HBO, one third-party contract signed, and they'll be testifying today in our TCA. But the genie is not out the bottle. There aren't other third-party contracts. And, Dad, you don't live in an area that NRTCA can serve under their contract. So, Dad, I guess you're just stuck. You either have to buy the cable or you've got to just take your over-the-air programming as best you can. Dad did that. He bought a rotator and he's taking this over-the-air programming. But you'll never convince my dad or that fellow in Fairfax that fair competition exists. You'll never convince him that I wasn't right when I asked this body and this Congress to look at creating real third-party packages of cable programming delivered over the air from the satellites to consumers. And you won't convince me nor my dad nor that gentleman standing in front of the Fairfax Council that we've got to fix this problem. We either have to re-regulate or we have to ensure fair competition. Let me commend my good friend Rick Boucher for his efforts. And let me ask him and others to join me in efforts I'm going to continue to make this year again. We're preparing another offering on fair competition in satellite distributed programs. We're not going to simply apply it to the, uh, to the current status of satellite delivered programs. A new offering will apply to the new KU band programs that are planned for several years hence. Because you see, it will do no good to have a new conduit a new KU band satellite delivering services on a smaller dish, maybe more affordable and more accessible to urban as well as rural consumers if we don't have fair marketing on the books. If we have the same bus driver just driving down a different route, I suspect the price of the ride will be the same and the terms and conditions of the ride will be fairly similar. If we don't ensure that there is fair marketing for that ride, down that new corridor. We will have not done our duty, our responsibility, in light of the fact that we stand responsible for having deregulated what in effect is a monopoly to that fellow in Fairfax and to my dad in Chack Bay. That's our challenge, Mr. Mr. Chairman. And I think as we hear some more of the witnesses today, included among them will be representatives of the NRTCA and of the Satellite Broadcasting uh, uh, Association who will come together today to tell us that indeed there are ways for us to create effective competition in the delivery of telecommunication services in America. And if we're smart enough to do that here, if we're smart enough to wrestle with this problem satisfactorily, we don't have to get into extensive and ugly federal or state or local re-regulation, that we can give consumers choice and we can create for the marketplace a situation where the consumers are running the show rather than a limited number of people who run the conduits and the buses along those lines. I think we can do that, Mr. Chairman. I commend your efforts to call us all together in that effort. I only ask that we not let this congressional session pass without acting. We need to act now. My efforts and those of Mr. Boucher are not mutually exclusive. They are compatible, 
And I think somewhere along the path of either telco entry or satellite fare marketing or a combination of both, we can ensure for Americans a choice and ensure for this new developing technology a chance to really fairly compete in a marketplace that doesn't demand extensive federal or local regulation. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank the gentleman. A gentleman's time has expired. Uh, the chair recognizes the gentleman from Pennsylvania, Mr. Ritter. Thanks, Mr. Chairman, and I want to thank you for holding this hearing because I really believe that competition is going to provide uh, some of the basic answers to, to the problems that we're dealing with here over the cable industry. And I, I just want to say that uh, although there are situations out there where uh, there are single companies and they perhaps behave like monopolies, I, I, I've got to say that nationally the uh, provision of new services and new programs and, and uh, whole new uh, venues for consumers has, has uh, I think, been explosive since 1984. So there have been some very positive impacts of deregulation of this uh, cable industry. And, and I don't think we, we want to lose that. I don't think we want to throw any babies out with the bathwater. But competition uh, has always been the lifeblood of American uh, enterprise. The marketplace is the backbone of the financial success of business and the consuming public in this country. But the marketplace can break down where there's a monopoly supplier of, of a certain good. And there, there are, two, su there are two, such, two approaches to fixing such a situation. One approach is to regulate the monopoly, monopoly service provider as done by the FCC for local telephone companies. The other approach is to end the monopoly. And both approaches have value in certain situations. The local cable company for much of the country is a local monopoly. And both of the aforementioned approaches have been tried to end that local monopoly. Prior to the 1984 Cable Act, regulation was attempted. This didn't work as well as some had hoped, and the 1984 Cable Act resulted in the deregulation of 85% of the cable companies in the U.S. Currently, many of those companies are unregulated local monopolies. However, there are those cable systems who face direct competition from other cable systems. And I'm proud to say that some of those cable companies in my district, the Lehigh Valley, are those who are competing for customers head-to-head. The plain fact is, and the gentleman, uh, Mr. Boucher, mentioned this, is that these cable systems charge approximately 60% of what the cable companies uh, nationwide charge, and, and, uh, and I think that includes the Washington, D.C. E, area charge for equivalent basic service. The situation in the Lehigh Valley of Pennsylvania and similar ones elsewhere have shown me that competition in the cable industry could lead to reasonable prices and good service. With competition, the marketplace decides on price and the consumers can demand better service. With regulation, there are artificial rates and inefficient regulation of service. With, with competition, there's an incentive to improve the technology and the communications infrastructure and to keep costs below one's competitors and service better than one's competitors. But with regulation, there's only one incentive, and that's to keep the cost down in order to make the most profits within the regulated rate framework. Today we ask, where will this competition come from? Will effective competition come from DBS or wireless cable? Will it come from other cable companies? Will competition come from telephone companies? I hope today's witnesses will be able to answer some of those questions with a response uh, of all of the above. Now we know that DBS is not yet available, but hopefully will be soon. Many of our nation's foremost and most creative companies are working on providing DBS services. The, re the advances in technology, as the chairman has pointed out earlier, are remarkable. Providing uh, the initial HDTV service may be a key incentive for moving this technology more into a mass marketplace. Wireless cable, while available in a few areas of the country, has run into some obstacles. The technology requires line of sight, which makes it difficult in certain areas of the country. But again, technology is beginning to solve the line of sight problem by improving signal bending abilities and obtaining better sight locations and better transmission transmitters. The other main obstacle is the ability to obtain programming, which we, I understand, will be dealing with in another hearing. Other cable companies can provide competition as they do in my district. 
The problem is that many of the local franchising authorities are only willing to franchise one company to provide cable service. We should consider promoting a climate where franchising authorities understand that multiple cable systems can be of great help to consumers. And finally, we come to the telephone companies. Telephone companies would be a natural choice to provide competition to cable services. If a telco were to provide cable service outside of the area it provides phone service, it could be treated just the same as any other cable company. However, where the telco wishes to provide cable service simultaneously with phone service, we have another story. The telcos already have wires into the home. If they were allowed to provide cable TV services into the home, they would have massive additional incentive to lay fiber optic cable and thereby improve the country's telecommunications infrastructure. Improvement of that infrastructure should be a top priority for U.S. technological and competitive preeminence. If we allow telcos to provide cable service where they provide telephone service, we need to make sure that there are adequate safeguards to prevent anti-competitive behavior such as cross-subsidization, cross-marketing, and abuse of the bottleneck. Finally, no matter who provides wired cable services, we need to make sure that new providers are not given any unfair advantage over existing cable companies. The new providers should be required to obtain a franchise from the local authority, just like the cable companies do, and must be subject to existing FCC rules and requirements of the Cable Act. All companies should be able to compete on a level playing field. As I've stated before, with the possible exception of some interim measures, there is less need at this time to re-regulate the cable industry than there is a need to promote and stimulate competition in the cable field. Let's give competition a fighting chance. Mr. Chairman, I look forward to hearing the testimony of today's distinguished witnesses. And I yield back. Thank the gentleman's you. time has expired. The chair recognizes the gentleman from New York State, uh, Mr. Scheuer. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, it's a pleasure. <clears throat> for me to serve on this committee for a lot of reasons. First of all, the, the subject matter is absolutely fascinating. I must be the most senior junior member of any committee <laughs> of Congress. Uh, second, I really appreciate the quality of the chairman's uh, leadership, and I congratulate you for not only this hearing, but the series of hearings that have been so illuminating. And third, I must confess that the quality of the remarks of this committee on both sides of the aisle has been exceptional. It's truly exceptional. I think a visitor from Mars would say, hey, those guys are a really talented group. There's a tremendous aggregation of talent here on both sides, and, and I enjoy that. Uh, I only want to make one brief point. I know we're keen to get to the witnesses. We're near the end of the line of the members. Uh, uh, all of the things that we've talked about, and I don't want to retread uh, that, the question of, of competition is terribly important. The question of the <clears throat> level playing field is terribly important. One problem that we have in New York, and we have in Washington, Mr. Chairman, is non-availability. Uh, there are large sections that don't have cable television. Many of them are low income sections, and we urgently need to get on with the business of assuring uh, not only the uh, quality of program, of program that is uh, improved by leaps and bounds, and not only the coverage that has gone up from about 37 percent to 58 percent in, in recent years, uh, but the critical need of the areas that are not served, and I live in two cities where major areas are not served, including uh, uh, people who are educationally and culturally in, in desperate need of the marvelous programming that are all on. So I hope that uh, we'll be giving uh, real attention to the problem of availability, to the problems of increasing the network of coverage of television so that the people in our society perhaps who have most to benefit uh, will be able to get on board the train and enjoy the superb uh, potential of this fantastic medium. Mr. Chairman, I've been asked by uh, the people in my city uh, to, uh, to submit for the record, and I ask unanimous consent that I can do this, the policy positions on a cable uh, by the National Associations of Local Governments. And that includes National Association of Counties, National Conference of Black Mayors, the National League of Cities, and the U.S. Conference of Mayors.
Yeah. It's unanimous consent that their Without policy position will be included people. in the record. It's I, appropriate. I thank the chairman. Position. I thank the gentleman very much. And uh, the gentleman's time has expired. And all time for opening statements by members of the subcommittee has expired. So we'll turn then to our first panel, which is a very distinguished panel indeed. It consists of the Honorable Charles A. Devaney, who is the mayor of the city of Augusta, Georgia. And he's here testifying on behalf of the National League of Cities and the U.S. Conference of Mayors. Uh, the Honorable Patricia uh, uh, Worthy, who uh, has uh, testifying for her today, Caroline Chambers, who is the Director of Congressional Affairs for the uh, National, uh, for the uh, Communications Committee of the National Association of Regulatory Utility Commissioners. Uh, Mr. Robert Brown, who is the President and Chief Executive Officer of Sugarland Telephone, uh, Telephone from Sugarland, Texas. Mr. A. Gray Collins, Jr., who is the Executive uh, Vice President for External Affairs from Bell Atlantic uh, Corporation. Uh, Mr. William J. Bresnan, who is the President of Bresnan Communications Company here from White Plains, New York. And Mr. Tom Gillette, who is the Vice President for Business Development and Technology Transfer <coughs> for the Cable Television Laboratories Incorporated in Boulder, Colorado. Uh, we welcome all of you, and as you can see, there's an enormous amount of uh, interest which the members have in the um, issues which you are going to be discussing before us today, and we look forward to a lively exchange. What I would like to request from each of you is that you restrict your opening comments to five minutes. Uh, we will try to enforce that with some limited flexibility so that uh, it will allow for the subcommittee members uh, to fully engage the uh, panelists uh, in a uh, lively uh, uh, exchange of ideas between the subcommittee members and the panelists. So we'll begin then with uh, you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, we welcome you to our subcommittee, uh, and uh, we look forward to your testimony. So if you can just pull that microphone up whenever you feel comfortable, please begin. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the subcommittee. On behalf of the National League of Cities and the United States Conference of Mayors, I thank you for the opportunity to testify here today. As you may know, the League represents more than 16,000 cities and towns across the nation. And the conference represents the more than 800 mayors in this country serving cities with populations exceeding 30,000 residents. Since cable television is increasingly becoming the sole source of video information to most U.S. households, competitive issues involving this medium are of critical importance to our nation's municipalities. When Congress passed the Cable Communications Policy Act of 1984, the cities hoped the measure would foster competition, which, in turn, would result in improved yet affordable cable service for the nation's consumers. Unfortunately, however, such competition has not materialized. The negative impact of the absence of competition has been exacerbated by FCC and court actions. The FCC has adopted regulations which make it impossible for cities to protect consumers from skyrocketing cable rate increases and which preclude franchising authorities from ensuring that cable operators provide a signal quality commensurate with developments in modern technology. At the same time, the federal courts have narrowly construed the power of franchising authorities under the Cable Act while the renewal provisions of the Cable Act have given cable operators claims to a perpetual monopoly and little incentive to upgrade service. The result is that the cable industry has become a virtually unregulated monopoly, which has not been fully responsive to consumer needs and interest. If the American public is ever to receive the benefits envisioned by the Cable Act, Congress must pass comprehensive legislation governing the cable industry. Solutions which are designed simply to stimulate competition will not be adequate. Consumers will not realize the significant benefits contemplated by the Cable Act unless Congress takes legislative action which also restores local control over cable television. Attached to my written testimony is a paper in which the League and Conference, along with the City of New York, have provided, one, a detailed discussion of specific problem areas which warrant congressional attention, two, 
a summary of pending legislative measures, if any, which addresses these problems, and three, an outline of the League and Conference's recommendations for legislation which the Congress should adopt. I respectfully request that my written testimony and the attachment be included in the formal record of this hearing. We are pleased that several members of Congress, including members of this subcommittee, have introduced bills which address several of our concerns with the cable industry. We look forward to working with the Congress in developing legislation which addresses all of the issues of concern to our constituents. The League and Conference strongly believe that such cable legislation must, among other things, grant franchising authorities the power to ensure that any rate increases are fair, reasonable, and justifiable, and to establish meaningful signal quality technical standards which are responsive to consumer needs. Such legislation should also stimulate competition in local franchise areas by allowing franchising authorities to solicit additional bids for a franchise during the renewal process and by simplifying that process. Further, Congress should cap the number of subscribers nationwide a multiple system operator can serve. In addition, legislation is needed to prohibit cable operators and their affiliated programmers from discriminating against their competitors. Moreover, legislation encouraging cable operators to carry local television broadcast stations is needed. Finally, Congress should consider lifting, under appropriate circumstances and with adequate safeguards, the federal ban on cross-ownership of cable and telephone businesses, thereby providing potentially realistic options for those dissatisfied with current cable service. Let us also add that cities believe that all providers of multi-channel video service to the home should be required to abide by all local franchising requirements. We would also like to inform the subcommittee that the Trade Association of the Telephone Companies, the United States Telephone Association, assured cities in writing that its members would abide by all local franchising requirements if allowed entry into the cable marketplace. Other issues in need of legislative attention are addressed in my written testimony and in the attachment. Thank you again for the opportunity to share with you and the subcommittee our concerns. We trust that you will take the action necessary to enable all segments of our population to enjoy quality cable service at an affordable cost. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, very much. Our next uh, witness, uh, Ms. Carolyn um, Chambers, is uh, testifying. Uh, for the National Association of Regulatory Utility Commissioners of the United States. Welcome. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, let me at the outset apologize for Patricia Worthy, who very much wanted to be here today, but she fell ill last night and is in the hospital at the moment. The National Association of Regulatory Utility Commissioners represents the state officials who regulate the rates and services of local telephone companies. We therefore have a direct and substantial interest in any proposal to repeal the statutory or regulatory restrictions on telephone company provision of video programming. I want to make it clear from the outset that the association as yet has not determined to what extent, if at all, the restrictions on telephone company provision of video programming should be relaxed. However, policy adopted in 1988 reflects our unanimous belief that if the restrictions are lifted, state regulatory officials should be allowed to determine the extent to which cross-ownership is permitted within their state. Furthermore, state regulators must be allowed to regulate cross-ownership in whatever manner they deem necessary to protect the public interest, including determining the appropriate allocation of joint and common costs. Allow me to explain why this is good public policy. There are significant risks to letting telephone companies into the cable television business. They are much like the risks associated with allowing the Bell companies into information services content. The vision articulated by the telephone industry is one of a single wire into every home, which will be our sole source of voice, data, and video services. From a regulatory perspective, this single wire vision presents an accounting nightmare. Fairly allocating the costs of, local ex of the local exchange network is crucial to protecting basic telephone ratepayers from paying more than their fair share of costs. This is extremely difficult when virtually all telephone company facilities would be used in the provision of both competitive and regulated services. A common measure for allocating common costs is relative use. But imagine this. If customer Jones uses the telephone network for five hours each day, how do we know how much of that time was spent on plain old telephone service 
how much time was spent on his computer modem, and how much time was spent watching television. In light of telephone companies' natural incentive to collect as much of their costs as possible from the regulated business, regulators could have tremendous difficulty verifying the actual breakdown of voice data and video usage. Another risk is that telephone companies will accelerate their deployment of fiber optic technology in order to provide video programming only to find that, for whatever reason, they are unable to get sufficient revenues from that business to support their investment. Ratepayers are put in enormous risk of having to foot the bill for a new technology and new facilities that would not have been practically or financially justified for many more years. In addition to these known risks, the potential benefits we hear from the local exchange industry of allowing cross-ownership are far from guaranteed. The telephone industry offers itself as the competitive to solution to the problems of high rates and poor service quality which have plagued the cable television industry since deregulation. While the NARUC supports both competitive and regulatory means to protect the interests of cable television subscribers, competition from the telephone industry is simply not a realistic option in most communities in the near term. Most telephone companies will not have the facilities in place to provide video for many years. The telephone industry also contends that their being barred from the video market is preventing people living in rural areas or other areas currently unserved by cable from getting video programming. Clearly there's a problem if people who want cable television are not getting it. However, it should be noted that the rural exemption from the cross-ownership rules has resulted in very few telephone companies providing video in these areas. Therefore, even if the cross-ownership restriction is removed, telephone companies are likely to find, as the cable industry has, that without subsidies, certain markets are simply uneconomic to serve. Finally, there's some question as to whether the telephone companies would actually provide a competitive alternative to cable television. As I mentioned, the industry's stated goal is to eliminate the need for more than one single wire into the home. This suggests that cable companies are more interested in replacing existing cable systems than competing with them. Since many communities will be unable economically to support more than one provider of service, telco entry may result either in cable TV or telco TV, but not both. Because basic telephone service and cable service are local in nature, a prudent policy on cross-ownership would allow state regulators to individually evaluate the risks and benefits of telco entry in the markets within their state and would reserve for them the authority to dictate the terms and conditions of such entry. Specifically, state regulators need the authority to restrict telco involvement in the provision of video if they find it is in the public interest to do so. The NARUC also strongly believes that state regulators should determine the appropriate allocation of network costs that are shared by telephone and video customers. Telephone network development and user needs have not evolved at the same pace or in the same way in all areas of the country. In many states, it may make sense to allocate costs differently to take factors such as these into account and to target certain investment. In addition, the abilities of the states to track costs vary. States must be able to use the methods they have found to be effective in protecting ratepayers, such as requiring separate subsidiaries. State regulators should also be permitted to ensure that telephone ratepayers share in any operating efficiencies gained from the provision of new services such as video. Our specific concerns about Congressman Boucher's H.R. 2437 are detailed in our written statement. Thank you for your attention. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you um, very, very much for your testimony. The next witness is Mr. Robert uh, C. Brown, who is the President and Chief Executive uh, Officer of uh, Sugarland Telephone here from uh, Sugarland, Te Texas. Welcome. Uh, good morning, or afternoon, I guess. Uh, Mr. Chairman, members and members of the subcommittee. I'm Bob Brown, President and CEO of SLT Communications, Inc. I'm also the third, third Vice Chair of the United States Telephone Association, a national representative body of the local exchange industry. USTA represents the 11,000 telephone, telephone companies throughout the United States. I appear today before this committee in each of those capacities. SLT Communications is a small but diverse telecommunications company. We provide telephone service to 36,000 customers in 17 different communities. In an effort to improve the quality of life for our customers, we also provide cable television service to 1,000 customers in nine communities within our telephone service area. SLT is also engaged in a number of other unregulated businesses, such as paging and cellular. One of our companies sells a full range of telco-related software packages domestically and internationally. 
I would like to share with the members of this committee some of SLT's cable experience and purge the record of many of the telco bashing myths that are circulating here in Washington. Our largest telephone operation is Sugarland Telephone Company, located in Sugarland, Texas. For those of you who may not know who Sugarland is, and, and uh, Mr. Fields uh, uh, told you this morning, we're located uh, 15 miles southwest of Houston. By the way, which is the fastest growing area presently in East Texas. Because Sugarland was without the benefits of cable television service, my company applied for a waiver of the Telco Cross Ownership Rules. We made this filing in the fall of 1979. Sugarland's petition was opposed by two cable operators, both of whom indicated a willingness to construct and operate a cable system in the Sugarland telephone service area. This was a significant change in cable's positions, as prior to our filing, no independent cable operator had expressed an interest. Mr. Brown, can Agent you move the microphone just a little bit closer? Some of the members are having some difficulty in hearing you. Thank Is this you. better? Yes, thank you. This was a significant change in Cable's position as prior to our filing, no independent cable operator had expressed a genuine interest in constructing a system in Sugarland. Our waiver request was based on the premise that Sugarland would construct a cable system that served the entire service area, even the remote regions. We sought relief pursuant to the other good cause criteria of the cross ownership rules, which allows for a waiver of the rule upon a showing of good cause. Our basis for the rule was that we would build a system that would be partially integrated with the telephone facilities, thus providing lower telephone and cable costs to consumers. The FCC, however, relying on the cable company's expressed interest in providing cable service in Sugarland service area, denied our request. They determined that our, the proposal of our joint operation did not overcome the policy considerations favoring an independent cable operator. That Sugarland was not granted the waiver is not, however, the end of the story. After the Commission de denied Sugarland's petition, neither of the cable companies that had so vigorously opposed our application then actively sought the Sugarland cable franchise. A group of local investors eventually built a cable system to serve part of the area. In addition, this system, in addition to this system not serving the whole area, it has been sold three times and is largely deficient of the services we could and would have provided. As a result of Sugarland Telephone Company not being authorized to enter the cable television business in Sugarland, no broadband two-way capability is available to the homes in the Sugarland community. There's no integrated system is available with the ability to provide new and different services requiring bandwidth and excess of voice grade. And there are over a thousand homes in Sugarland that we would have served that are still without service. Mr. Chairman, what public policy is served by continuing to deny, deny access to cable service to these 1,000 homes? While this committee was guided by what it believed to be the best interests of the consumer and nation in 1984, circumstances have changed significantly in the interim. It is now imperative that telco entry not only be permitted, but encouraged. Mr. Chairman, mine is not really a cable bashing mission but a vision shared by many members of this subcommittee of a universally available broadband fiber optic switch network. The opponents of change in their quest to maintain the status quo falsely argue that, one, all services except full motion video can be delivered over copper, and not coincidentally that video delivery should be left to the cable industry. Two, that the cost of fiber is too expensive and there are no safeguards against cross-subsidization. And three, there can be no protection against cross-subsidization if telephone companies are permitted to compete. Each of these arguments should be recognized for what they are, uh, protectionist pleadings, but certainly not the truth. In the interest of time, I will focus on the most offensive of these myths, cross-subsidization. As to the claims of our detractors that we will cross-subsidize and that no level of government Mr. can properly police against cross-subsidies. Mr. Brown, I hate to interrupt you at this point, but I'm, I have to notify you that your five minutes has expired. And if you want to summarize for 20 seconds or so, that would be fine, but I'm afraid you won't be able to go much further than that at this point in time. You'll be, allowed, you'll be able to elaborate when we get to the, uh, to the uh, question and I guess I would period. summarize by saying that my company presently is audited by 12 different entities annually, 
And uh, to claim now that we can cross-subsidize in the non-regulated business that we're already in seems a little bit ridiculous to me. Okay. I thank you, Mr. Brown, very much. Our next witness, Mr. William J. Bresnan, is the president of Bresnan Communications uh, Company. Welcome. Could you move that microphone over, please? Members of the subcommittee, my name is William J. Bresnan. I'm president of Bresnan Communications Company. I'm also a member of the board of directors of the National Cable Television Association. I'd like to emphasize three points today. First, how cable continues to use technology to expand choices for consumers. Second, why Congress decided in the interest of preserving competition to restrict the telephone companies from providing video programming. And third, why these cross-ownership prohibitions still make sense today. Now first, as to cable increasing consumer choice. Mr. Chairman, cable television started as a rural technology in the mountains of Pennsylvania. Cable extended the reach of broadcast signals far beyond that put out by television transmitters and brought big city TV stations to rural families who could not get them with their own television antennas. Since those shoestring entrepreneurial days, cable has developed a broad range of its own programming and has moved more and more into populated areas to compete directly with television broadcasters. The cable industry has a right to be proud of the fact that it has provided consumers with a whole new world of television. First, we created new networks and new formats, from 24-hour news, public affairs networks, and music television to full-time children's channels, comprehensive entertainment services, and sports channels. Then, with rate deregulation, we were able to improve and expand the programming sources available to consumers. The public responded and subscribed to the cable services in record numbers. And finally, over the course of 15 years, we built an entirely new communications infrastructure in this country, marrying satellite technology with coaxial cable. The wiring of America was a colossal task. The cable industry now has more than 830,000 miles of coaxial plant, which passes more than 80 million households. We are now acting to strengthen our customer service and extend, extend our reach into the community. And when I entered the cable television business in 1958, the economics of our distribution technology allowed us to build out into the country if we could serve about 60 homes per route mile. Today, largely as a result of deregulation by the Cable Act of 1984, we can ser serve areas with an average of 10 homes per route mile. Now as to the cable telco cross ownership ban, the diversity and choice now present in the television marketplace are also due to the decisions by the Congress and the FCC made to bar telephone companies from providing television programming. Congress has long recognized that telephone companies have the power to eliminate diversity and competition if they are allowed to provide both the transmission of information and its content. As a result, Congress has generally prohibited telephone companies from creating, controlling, or having any financial interest in the content of information transmitted over their monopoly facilities. This policy was incorporated in the Cable Communications Policy Act of 1984. Telephone companies are permitted by the Act to construct, maintain, and lease transmission facilities for franchise cable operators who can then provide the video programming to the public. However, the Act prohibits telcos from actually entering the television business and controlling the content of what viewers see on their television screens. Finally, telcos as competitors. The cross-ownership ban reflects a simple fact. Telephone companies have a long record of anti-competitive behavior. For as long as they've been in business, telephone companies have favored their own subsidiaries and discriminated against competitors in access, pricing, and quality of service. It was, after all, Bell's system extensive and system systemic and anti-competitive behavior that caused two Republican administrations, as well as the Carter administration, to pursue the breakup of AT&T. The telephone industry is now pursuing a series of arguments about fiber, new information services, and TV in rural areas, which are designed to convince you to strike down the cross-ownership restrictions. As I discuss in my written testimony, which I'm filing with you today, these arguments have little substance. Teleco, teleco entry into video continues to pose substantial risks. Based on its, extens its extensive hearings, this subcommittee is well aware that the telcos have strong economic incentives to shift costs in ways that disadvantage competitors and consumers alike. Telephone companies continue to act on these anti-competitive incentives today. Studies by NARUP, the GAO, and others have demonstrated that cross-subsidization and anti-competitive behavior have persisted since divestiture. Indeed, the FCC has been unable to prevent the misallocation of costs as witnessed by the recent audit of 9X, which uncovered $120 million in improper charges. Similarly, Bell Atlantic has, has agreed to pay $42 million after the state of Pennsylvania accused it of deceptive sales practices. 
In conclusion, rather than promote competition, allowing telcos into cable business would kill competition and would restore the days when a monopoly delivered all information, voice, and data services over a single wire. Such a world would contrast sharply with the mix of broadcast, cable, DBS, and print media we enjoy today. It is for this reason that the cable industry, as well as such diverse groups as the Consumer Protection, Consumer Federation of America, the American Association of Retired Persons, the National Association of Broadcasters, and the American Newspaper Publishers Association all believe that content conduit distinction in the Cable Act should be preserved. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Uh, our next witness, Mr. Robert, uh, uh, I'm sorry, where am I going here now? Gray Collins. Mr. A. Gray Collins, Jr. is the Executive Vice President for External Affairs for the Bell Atlantic Corporation. Uh, here in Arlington, Virginia. Welcome. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm here to discuss Bell Atlantic's views on cable legislation. We believe uh, Congress should set national policy in this area. As you know, under existing law, telephone companies can, as common carriers, carry broadband signals, including the signals of video programmers who hold local franchises. They cannot, however, okay. be full-service cable companies. Bell Atlantic wants to be a full-service cable company. Bell Atlantic believes a common carrier broadband network will bring competition to cable and make available to consumers a host of innovative and two-way interactive services. Removal of the restrictions that prevent the telephone companies from providing video program is vitally important to achieving the speedy deployment of this network. Any re-regulation of cable is at best a band-aid approach. The permanent answer is competition. The most direct way to achieve cable competition is the approach taken in the Boucher-Madigan bill, and that is the elimination of the statutory restriction that prevents the telephone companies from functioning as full-service cable television providers in their local areas. Cable companies have a private monopoly on broadband transmission because typically a cable company has the only cable system in the communities where it operates. There's a scarcity of quality programming, and most of existing program sources are tied up by the incumbent cable operators. Cable telephone companies, excuse me, telephone companies can provide an environment that will eliminate these barriers. First, if we are permitted to provide video programming, we will have the added incentive to upgrade our common carrier broadband network to carry video signals of multiple CATV operators, broadcasters, independent programmers, and two-way interactive programs. Our modern, efficient network will mean lower rates and better services for consumers and a broader choice of program. And second, the telephone companies have the economic resources to finance additional quality program and are therefore capable of increasing the supply of that quality programming and competing with the entrenched cable companies. What sort of programming might our common carrier network carry? An example, broadcasters typically film many Olympic and other sports events simultaneously, but show the viewing audience only one event at a time. Our broadband network would have enough capacity to transmit all of the pictures simultaneously, allowing the viewers to choose the event they want to see. In addition, such a network could store transmissions, allowing viewers to watch the events when they wanted to see them. Because the network would have sufficient capacity to transmit high-definition television for the viewer, the viewer would receive a much clearer picture. The same capabilities would help disabled persons who are unable to travel. A disabled person could take a video tour of a museum, browse among the artworks, study and stop at those of particular interest and see the art in vivid detail. The network could also be used for educational purposes. If I had time, I'd explain some of those. Now, some critics argue that allowing telephone companies to become full-service cable providers will result in the substitution of one monopoly with another. This is absolutely not the case. Allowing the telephone companies in video programming will increase the supply of programs and give customers additional choices. The revenues from common carriage transport of these additional telephone company programs will give the telephone companies additional incentives to accelerate the deployment of a public fiber optic network, 
which will be available to all video programmers on a non-discriminatory basis. Cable companies will still have their own delivery systems and program arrangements in place. Even if the telephone companies had the only available network, programmers and consumers would still be protected by the telephone company's common carrier obligation to make access available to all programmers on a non-discriminatory basis. Because of this obligation and because of the tremendous capacity of the broadband network, programmers will be able to enter the market simply by leasing channels or by leasing time slots. Some critics argue the telephone companies will cross-subsidize their cable operations from their basic telephone business, putting basic ratepayers at risk of increased telephone rates. Bell Atlantic endorses the approach in the voucher Madigan bill, which requires the FCC to prescribe safeguards. Telephone companies are already subject to extensive safeguards, for example, cost accounting and auditing rules. Apply now when a telephone company provides regulated and unregulated services. You should also know that Bell Atlantic Corporation is flat, uh, excuse me, approach is flatly inconsistent with the notion of cross subsidies. Cross subsidization arguments depend on the existence of traditional cross plus rate of return regulation. Bell Atlantic is committed to regulatory reform which would do away with the cost plus regulation that makes cross subsidies a theoretical concern. The cross-subsidy argument can also be belied by Bell Atlantic's business activities since divestiture. We have invested in a number of, number of unregulated businesses, but we, do not, we have not filed a rate increase in our local telephone rate since 1985. One additional point. Electric utilities, who have the same theoretical ability to cross-subsidize as rate-regulated companies as the telephone companies would, have not been accused of any cross-subsidy. And yet, the, tele the electric companies are allowed to own their uh, cable companies and provide video programming in the areas that they serve. There's been no outcry to restrict them from cable activities. Thank you for the opportunity to be here today. Thank you, Mr. Collins, very much. Our next uh, witness, Mr. Tom uh, Gillette, is the Vice President for Business Development and Technology Transfer from the Cable Television Laboratories Incorporated in Boulder, Colorado. Welcome. Thank you. Uh, cable Labs is responsible for research and development on behalf of the cable industry in such areas as fiber optics, high definition, advanced television, consumer interface, systems engineering, and network planning. Besides my one year of cable experience, I do have 19 years of telephone industry exper experience, nine with GTE, where among other things I conceived, planned, executed, and ran GTE's Cerritos experiments, and 10 years with the Bell system. The cable industry, telephone industry, and even many private companies are using fiber optics today in their telecommunications networks. Such utilization in the appropriate high traffic density areas of a network, including directly to some business, computer, and medical locations, is cost effective and improves the quality of transmission. However, forcing that technology today or for the foreseeable future to the curb or to the home results in inflated costs and reduced reliability. For the foreseeable future, one, fiber to the home is too costly for POTS, that's plain old telephone service, and two, fiber to the home is too costly and very unfriendly for video. Fiber will continue to be one of the technological tools that plays a role in helping to better serve America, but it is not the panacea espoused by some, and in fact its misuse, such as fiber to the home, would be a costly detriment to our country's future. More importantly, fiber to the home does nothing to improve our country's ability to have information services. We do not need any fiber to the home in order to offer educational, health, shop at home, medical imaging, home banking, or video tech services. The information age need not be held hostage waiting for fiber to the home. With fiber to the home for either voice, data, or video being both unneeded and too costly, why then are the telcos so aggressively pursuing the strategy? A simplistic business answer is that they forecast, incorrectly, that their core business, voice and data services, has minimal growth and they fear a declining rate base. Instead of concentrating on marketing services, they are pursuing a pad-the-rate-based strategy. At the recent Senate Communications Subcommittee hearing on telco entry into cable, GTE and Bell Atlantic said they did, not not, excuse me, they did not know what it will cost to build a broadband network to the home. Southern Bell has also said they do not know what the costs are. Yet in spite of not being able to predict the cost, the telcos want to go ahead. Why? Because no matter what it costs, they are guaranteed that their telephone ratepayers will pay for it. Bell South, via increased depreciation expense, wants these increased consumer costs to begin now, even though its own Bellcor forecasts indicate that by the year 2000, only 5% of their customers will be utilizing Bell South's broadband services. 
a 5% that, according to its forecast, includes only businesses and wealthy residences. In short, Bell South wants all of its customers to pay into Bell South's bank so that one in 20 of their better, better off customers 10 years from now might benefit. Our country needs information services now, affordably, and for everyone. Telco's fiber to the home plans will not achieve that. Their inflated rate base, high cost approach can at best serve only the rich and will put our country at a competitive disadvantage in the international marketplace. It is interesting to note that in America, where the telcos are following their build the rate base strategy, they are pursuing high cost fiber to the home networks. However, in their ventures in Europe and Asia, where they are trying to be competitive and market responsive, the same telcos are building fiber coax networks. Besides the wrong technical solution, I believe the telco video business strategy should also be questioned. The home entertainment video market is currently a highly competitive one. Customers have several suppliers to choose from, that is over the air, home video, cable and satellite, and the average cable network today of 35 channels already offers a viewer over 1,000 programming choices a day. Telco, however, does not intend to add to that competitive environment, but to eliminate it. GTE's and Southern Bell's public documents clearly show that it is the intention of at least those two telcos not to act as competitive alternatives, but to eliminate existing video suppliers. And the telcos will use funds from their telephone ratepayers to achieve their video vision. I believe that the challenge for all of us is to serve America, not to technology her. Telcos have over the years made many residential services promises based on either ISDN, video techs, gateways, class, or signaling system seven. They should be encouraged and directed, if necessary, to concentrate on delivering those promises now. Telco's expanded entry into video would act as a significant distraction and financial drain on the Telco's ability to make those voice data and information services a reality for America. Is our country best served if the rules are now changed so the Telco's try to take away cable's core business and perhaps vice versa? Is the customer best served by having each industry trying to bypass the other? Physical network to the home competition, whether for electric, telephone, or cable, instead of lowering consumer rates, can ultimately only result in inflated costs due to duplicated and wasted capital. Those higher costs will result in many customers not being able to afford telephone or cable and will put our country at a cost disadvantage in the international competitive arena. Instead of needless physical network competition, let's have telco, satellite, and cable industries working together to optimally serve America now. Transport cooperation and services competition provides Americans with the best information age value and places America in the strongest position internationally. Let's get on with serving our country now. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, uh, Mr. Mm -hmm. Gillette very much and I think you very well summarized our challenge here which is to uh, make some decisions as to what the mix will be of uh, technologies in the future which will serve the American public and uh, what kinds of regulations we need to you know, create that environment and on the other hand what kinds of regulations we need on the books to protect the public uh, waiting for that ideal marketplace to uh, have been constructed. Now. The chair will recognize itself for an opening round of uh, questions. And what I'd like to do is uh, go to you first, uh, Mr. Bresnan, and, and, to, uh, uh, and to deal with the uh, suggestion which you have injected into this debate that if we, in fact, uh, lifted the cable telephone company uh, restrictions, uh, that it could result in a distorted video marketplace. And let me quote from your statement. You say, the telephone company, not the public, would determine the nature and the cost of those services and consumers would be left with no alternatives. It obviously raises the, the question of how would that be any different uh, from the existing condition with regard to the relationship between the cable industry and consumers today. Uh, what alternatives do they have and why would uh, not the entry of the cable, uh, uh, the uh, telephone industry, as a competitor to the, ca to the cable industry, uh, not provide alternatives which do not exist today? Because what you have with the telephone industry is a, is a very large uh, monopoly a ser providing a, uh, uh, a necessary service with a guaranteed return on its investment which can, it can use to cross-subsidize its uh, so-called competitive business and really drive the others out of, out of business. I, I read here recently uh, an interview by the chairman, I believe it was, of Bell Atlantic, Ray Smith, who said uh, in Atlanta that the, he will 
even put the broadcasters out of business. You're going to put the cable television companies out of business. You're going to put the broadcasters out of business. I understand. Right now, but even I'm at sorry. the same time, Mr. President, you have a, a condition which exists today, which um, the uh, the cable uh, industry is in a situation where a 99 percent of the communities which have cable uh, in place, there are no other cable systems. So de facto, you have that kind of a control right now in those communities where the cable industry is in place. Two, two points. First of all, the, te the television broadcasters, the three major networks, garner 60 percent of the audience. The, the three major networks plus the independents garner 82 percent of the audience. Now the 25 cable channels all together garner about as much as one over the one of the national over the air networks. So the question. So, and second, secondly, the question obviously is is that in, in that uh, there seems to be no we, obvious reason why the telephone companies couldn't also provide that access into the homes uh, that the uh, that the broadcasters would want for their signals, and why should there only be one way in which that could be achieved? Or uh, programmers or producers that have independent product that would want to uh, find an, addition, an, an alternate avenue to the, tele, to the uh, cable industry of getting into the American home. I think they've made it very clear that they don't want to create competition. What they want to do is eliminate competition. They want to use their facilities to replace the cable systems, to replace the broadcasters. And if we had such a monopoly today, why is it that we only have 57 percent penetration? And the answer to the question is? There's a variety of choices. There's over-the-air broadcast services. There's, there's the video discs. There's the video set recorders. There's the home satellite receivers. The marketplace is functioning. So th I guess the issue is that at 56 to 57 percent uh, penetration of the marketplace, there still is a 43 percent uh, of the market which is uh, still not um, serviced. And in addition, well, there is a dissatisfied, as you know, um, percentage uh, of uh, consumers of cable service today, uh, which uh, uh, has to be dealt with either by the introduction of alternative ways of gaining access to these services or by re-regulation. And what I'd like to do is just move on as a result to, to the, because I'm limited by, my, by the five-minute restriction as well, to the question of the, um, the problem which we have in projecting the point at which uh, cable telco or uh, satellites or some other uh, means of communication of, of programming uh, will serve as an effective check on the cable industry. So what do we do then during that interim period of time? And first, let's try to establish what that period of time might be and, and ask you, Ms. Chambers, what would you believe would be a, a reasonable amount of time to project the um, introduction of and the uh, consumer satisfaction with uh, the satellite uh, communication of, uh, of entertainment, news, and sports programming in this country? And in that way, would have some sense as to what the time frame is that we should be looking at at least in that issue and I'll also ask you subsequently to deal with the cable telco issue in terms of when we could reasonably project if we did allow them into the uh, into the cable industry uh, when that would also serve as an effective check across the country. Uh, I, I'm really not in a position to comment on the availability of some of these other uh, forms of delivery. Maybe Mr. Gillette could do that. <laughs> Um, as far as, as fiber uh, deployment, uh, that will take place based on uh, uh, when, in, an, in, an, in the natural course of events, the existing copper wires would be fully depreciated and needed to be replaced. And then that varies quite a bit from market to market. I guess the question I would ask is this. If, for example, Mr. Bausch's bill would pass and the cable uh, industry uh, was joined by the telephone industry in provision of uh, video services. How long do you think it would take for the telephone companies to be able to provide competition that would then uh, um, negate the necessity for uh, tougher regulation over the cable industry during that uh, interim period? 
again, I, I don't think I could give you a specific figure, but I think our feeling is that it would take long enough so that Congress really should look at some of the regulatory options now. Uh, there certainly wouldn't be effective competition in the near term. Okay. Well, I, let me refer to the, the testimony that you and Chairman Worthy um, have presented to us in written form. You say that competition from the telephone industry may not be a realistic option in many communities in the near term, and most telephone companies will not have facilities in place to provide video for many years. Um, do any of the rest of you have any sense of how long it might take to uh, to uh, see a, uh, a, rural, a provision of rural video services by the telephone companies? Mr. Collins? I'd be happy to answer that. Uh, uh, first, uh, any, any further delay by this committee or Congress or other bodies that have influence is just going to delay the availability of a fiber network. Secondly, uh, Mr. Gillette, I really don't know what laboratory he works for, but I can assure you that if coax was a better solution than cable, than uh, fiber, we'd be putting coax between our central offices today. So we, fiber is a better solution, has higher capacity, and is cheaper. And we are placing it throughout our network. Now, we have made a study in Bell Mr. Atlantic. Collins, I'm going to have to, my time has expired I right now. And I'm I, sorry. I want to abide by that. And I'll come back to you. I'd like to be recognized on a second yeah. round. And I'm right sorry. now, my time has expired. And I recognize the ranking minority member, the gentleman from New Jersey, Mr. Ronaldo. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, we have a vote on, so I'm going to move along as quickly as I can. But as I understand it from uh, everything uh, we've, I've heard about this issue, the cable telephone cross ownership issue really seems to be just a video version of the information services issue. And what I'd like to ask, isn't the core issue the same, whether or not telcos can get into information content, whether it's video text or video programming? Who would like to uh, answer that one? I, I could just say from a regulatory perspective, the risks are virtually the same. Mr. Gillette? You? Well, I, I think we've seen over the last few years uh, uh, telcos had the ability, I believe, to play a very significant role in allowing this country to get into gateway services and video tech services. Frequently, uh, the Minitel example is given out of France as, as a service that would be exciting for America. And, and those, all those services could, in fact, have been delivered today over their existing networks, yeah. through their existing facilities. So it seems to me that there is a very good analogy between the promises that have been, de that have been made and not delivered on and the same thing I think, we're, think we are hearing about potential video promises that also will not be delivered on, and mainly because of economics. You, you know, there is no feasible way in any of the experience that I've had, and I've been able to look at this problem from both sides, to be able to build a fiber to the home network that can successfully compete in the video marketplace. It, it cannot compete against coax that can be put in for two or three or four hundred dollars a home when you're dealing with thousands of dollars for a fiber to the home alternative. Mr. Collins, I noticed you wanted to respond. Uh, yes. The, the cable legislation has been treated separately by uh, Congress and by this committee. Uh, the cable legislation does prevent the telephone companies from getting into cable TV, the full line of cable services, including the billing and collection, the menus that are on the screens, etc. The content is an issue that does overlap. I agree with that. The content you have kept separate in the MFJ proceedings uh, hearings. Well, let me take it. Uh, oh, Mr. Brown, I'm sorry. I didn't uh, yeah, I'd, I'd like to make a statement uh, and, and answer one of the questions uh, that uh, you ask. Uh, basically, my company, and I can't speak totally for the industry as much as Mr. Collins can, so obviously I'm very small. My company uh, is prepared to offer uh, cable service to those thousand homes that don't have it in Sugarland right now within about 30 days after we get the, the proper licenses. We would continue and move forward uh, with, with fiber, at least in our backbone system, as soon as the, the cross-ownership rules were changed. Okay, thank you. I want to stick with my line of questioning. Let me get back to Mr. Collins. Mr. Collins, doesn't the danger of cross-subsidy justify keeping you out at least until satisfactory safeguards are developed? I believe there are satisfactory safeguards in place, and I don't think we should hold back the technology and the consumer choice and the benefits of fiber and, and uh, introduction of competition into a monopolistic cable market until uh, we can get uh, safeguards, additional safeguards. We have safeguards today. FCC's got extensive safeguards. All right, well, in your testimony, you mentioned that Bell Atlantic endorsed 
having the FCC adopt rules to safeguard against cross subsidies. Yes, I did. Now, the subcommittee has been, as you know, considering legislation to permit Bell companies to provide information services only under separate subsidiaries. Would you support telco entry into cable only as a separate subsidiary? Uh, yes, uh, Bell Atlantic supports the notion that the cable function could be operated as a separate subsidiary. We, I think we've also uh, indicated our willingness to consider the information services as separate subsidiaries. I don't think the transport that underlies its part of the common carrier network, which would be available to everybody, should be in a separate sub. Only the cable function itself. All right. On your te in your testimony at pages three and four, you state, and I want to quote, the telephone companies have the economic resources to finance additional programming and are therefore particularly capable for increasing the supply of high quality programming, end quote. Now, if we eliminate the ability of telephone companies, as we just said, you and I both sort of agreed, to cross-subsidize their cable transmission and programming with telephone revenues, aren't we taking away the economic resources that you speak of? In other words, what special abilities will be left? financially and economically that telephone companies will have if they can't use funds derived from telephone service? The, tele the funds are not derived from telephone service as, as such. These are the stockholders' dividends, their earnings on the uh, telephone company business that they have the right to reinvest in the telephone network, which is largely what we could do today. And we would like to be able to invest in partnership and joint ventures in the development of new programming capabilities, education, medical, disability type services. That's the kind of uh, quality programs we're talking about. Would you say that uh, possibly there could be some telephone companies that would be more interested in buying into the cable industry than in competing with it? I would think there are some indications now from some uh, companies that they would. We have not uh, indicated that particular desire. We don't believe uh, that that's necessary. We believe that uh, we can enter the t cable business uh, uh, other ways, but we should not be prohibited from buying another uh, cable company. Let me just uh, shift to uh, Ms. Chambers. Do you feel that uh, Mr. Gray's response about, uh, Mr. Collins' uh, response rather, about uh, ratepayer subsidies was uh, appropriate from your vantage point? Well, I I think that uh, from a regulatory perspective, uh, despite what the carriers may say, they have a tremendous incentive to collect. I mean, we're talking about the exact same facilities here that would be providing video as providing basic telephone service. There's a tremendous incentive for the phone company to try and collect as much of the costs of that network from the regulated side of the business. And uh, I mean, not only do they, do they cover costs for their competitive services that way, but in most states they earn a profit on top of it. Um, and we're just very concerned that regulators don't have, in many cases, the resources necessary to verify uh, the allocation of costs, the appropriate allocation of costs. As we know, the FCC's resources were criticized by GAO as being insufficient to police their cost allocation rules. States have had equal difficulty, difficulty in, a, in obtaining access to the appropriate books and records to verify costs and so forth. So we're just, we're just very concerned that uh, despite the claims of the telephone industry, they just have natural incentives that we can't ignore. The uh, gentleman's time has expired and uh, the chair is going to declare a 10 minute recess so that members of the subcommittee can respond to the recorded vote now in progress. Subcommittee stands in recess. <laughs> Who's next, Rick? Uh, Rick's next. The committee will uh, please come to order. And uh, if we could uh, proceed, <clears throat> I would like at this time to uh, recognize the gentleman from the state of Virginia, Mr. Bauscher, for a round of questions. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Collins, I would like to start my questioning with you. One of the major reasons that we have argued for allowing telephone companies to provide cable television service 
is that it would, uh, it would hasten the day when we have a deployment of fiber optics uh, off of the telephone company's branch networks and into homes and businesses across the country. Uh, the argument is that telephone companies would then have the financial incentive to deploy fiber much more rapidly. I'd like for you, if you would, to put that issue into perspective and give us uh, some anticipated time frames within which we could anticipate the deployment of fiber in that manner uh, in the absence of this legislation first and then uh, assuming that this legislation passes. Uh, all right. Uh we believe that fiber is, of course, uh, needed for the public to realize the vision we're talking about. And frankly, we are putting the fiber into the network today. We have over 400,000 miles of it in. We're upgrading the network to digital and an intelligent network. Uh, fiber is being deployed as the most economic alternative in each route today as we build it. And eventually, if nothing else happens, we believe we'd have a full fiber network all the way out to the homes and and uh, uh, near the homes in, in our territory by the year 2030 or 2040. That's what we're talking about without the incentive to bring uh, the fiber in sooner. If we accelerate the deployment of fiber, we believe we could be able to order the fiber in larger quantities. We'll get massive uh, discounts. We'll reduce the cost significantly. We estimate that we'll reduce our cost by over a billion dollars if we allow it to uh, accelerate the fiber. We believe that the fiber cost will be about equal to the cost of copper, and when you put fiber in, it will have a higher quality, more economic, more capability than the copper. If we do that, we believe that we'll have uh, broadband two-way service available to everybody in the Bell Atlantic Territory, including the rural areas, by the year 2010. That's our objective. That's 20 years sooner and the same date that foreign countries who are undertaking the same activity would have it. So you would just about cut the time in half That's if, exactly. you, if you had the incentive that uh, the Cable Television Authority would provide. I, I could also add that uh, we believe certain areas would have the benefit of fiber much earlier than that. By 1995, 1997, we will have substantial fiber in certain areas. In the higher density areas, the That's cities correct. and the like. It's been suggested by some of the witnesses uh, in previous hearings and in some of the written testimony today that uh, the same kinds of services could be provided through a combination of the copper that telephone companies currently use and the coaxial cable that, uh, that uh, cable companies are using. And that fiber really for that reason doesn't give us very much. It doesn't add to the capabilities of delivering information. Now, I have heard uh, explanations uh, very much to the contrary, and I would appreciate your providing uh, a statement, if you would, of the kinds of benefits that could be provided by fiber that are not available through a combination of copper and coaxial cable. Well, the fundamental difference between copper and coax and fiber is the amount of uh, capacity that will be available, and therefore you increase the number of services available to the home. For, and the main, I believe, benefit would be the high-density television would come faster and sooner to America and it'd have more, more choices. That's the fundamental difference. So the key to that is the capacity? The capacity is the fundamental difference and the market will develop all kinds of uses that we can't uh, estimate today. A number of telephone companies, including Bell Atlantic, at the present time are building cable television uh, systems, they're installing the plant uh, with the intention then of leasing that plant to someone else uh, who will in turn provide the cable television service. And that is permissible under current law. The cross ownership restrictions don't prohibit that from happening. Uh, one example of that is the construction of the cable system here in the District of Columbia, which I understand CNP Telephone Company uh, is installing with the intention of leasing that uh, to the ultimate provider of the service. Now, my understanding is that that's happened about 300 times across the country to date. And my question to you is, are you aware of any instance in those 300 occasions where there has been a discovery of a cross-subsidy by the telephone company of its regulated business uh, by its unregulated, uh, of its unregulated business by its regulated business? I'm not aware of any uh, uh, example of that kind of cross-subsidy, and in D.C. I might point out that uh, we report to the PUC 
periodically on exactly what we're doing with that cable operation. That cable, by the way, is dedicated to DCI. It's not available for anybody else to use. We can't uh, have or build any other competitive broadband service without a franchise uh, uh, so, uh, cable company to use it. So um, you can interpret this as a leading question if you like, but uh, shouldn't that history of uh, there being no allegation or determination of cross-subsidy in that context give us confidence that once telephone companies are given the authority to offer cable television service, that uh, cross-subsidies would not occur in that context either? Well, I agree with you there. We have that evidence plus the evidence in the electric industry where there's no accusations of cross-subsidies. I don't know where the cross-subsidy argument come from, comes from. Mr. Bresnan, uh, uh, I'm sorry, Mr. Gillette, did you want to comment? Well, I, I, I'd appreciate it because I think you kind of, some of your questions I think may have been, I may have helped you create some of those questions in my testimony, so I'd like to put a couple of comments in. One, I think it's interesting to note that, that in the response to your questions, the, the scenario that was painted out for you was that if telcos are allowed into cable, then 20 years from now rural America might have fiber to the home. I don't think that's satisfactory. And in 1997, maybe high-density urban areas may have fiber to the home and these promises are coming along with it. I don't think that's satisfactory either, and I don't think this committee should stand for an information age plan that takes us 20 years to get to rural America. And in fact, that might be the best that you might see. And obviously, you know in my testimony, I don't think it'll even happen in that time frame. Number two, you talk about the difference between coax and fiber, and you talk about a capacity issue. It's not just the fiber alone that is the, is the capacity issue. It is the electronics at the end of the fiber. Fiber today with the electronics has significantly less capacity for video transport than coax. It is way behind in its ability to deliver video to the home. It is the inferior choice for delivering video to the home. It's got a great hype to it. There's a great place to use fiber. We use fiber a lot in our networks. It makes good sense for us. It improves the capacity and quality of our networks in the higher parts of our network, but it is not the right technology to take to the home. Uh, Mr. Brown, would you like to respond? Uh, yes, I would. Uh, uh, being one of those from rural America and who serves rural America, I uh, would like to say that uh, absent, absent the cross-ownership rule and based on the turnover of our plant right now and the growth of our system, we would have fiber in place within 10 to 15 years. Thank you for that. Uh, Mr. Bresnan and Mr. Gillette, either of you who would like to respond, um, I'm sure you recall in 1983 when Congress was debating the uh, Cable Act. Uh, Mr. Bresnan, I think you were on the board of the NCTA at that point in time. Uh, the predictions were generally made by NCTA spokesmen that within one year uh, there would be effective competition to cable by the means of direct broadcast satellite. Here we are seven years later and there is no evidence of that today. There are now plans to put a couple of services into effect, and uh, even those are highly uncertain, and the operational date for those programs is still well into the future if they materialize at all. So my question to you is, uh, assuming the general belief of members of this committee and other witnesses who have testified here that uh, competition to the cable TV industry is desirable, how do, we, uh, how do we go about assuring that competition if we don't let telephone companies provide it? The other potential means of offering that have uh, proven to be uh, very ineffective. And uh, so what's your answer to that? How do we assure competition if not by means of telephone company entry? I don't know the particular quote you're referring to, but uh, of course there has been competition with the C-band DBS uh, services, as you know, and the there is a K-band, KU-band service planned for this fall, to be inaugurated this fall. Uh, but as to the, the, the rest of our service, you know, there is a lot of competition. As I said before, we're competing with over-the-air television, and we really are. I mean, when you see CBS announce that it's, you know, making a major league sports deal, it's getting it away from ESPN, that, that is... Mr. That President, is a, could you pull the microphone slightly closer, sure. please? Uh, we are competing with, with the uh, over-the-air services, and that's, that's one of the reasons why our penetration is 57 percent. But some of the people say, I, I'll, I'll take the other sources. I'll take the, the C-band satellite. I'll take the KU-band satellite when it comes. I'll take the video discs, the video cassette recorders. We are competing. And the thing that I'm saying, uh, Congressman, is, 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 is I'm not against competition, and I'm not against if we could figure out some fair way of doing it. But I just am not a believer that you can do it without the cross-subsidization. I mean, when you see what's happening 
with the 9X you know, the announcement here just recently. I mean, there, there's stuff that goes on with these guys. They are so big, and, uh, and they have a, the, the unique thing about them is that they're providing an essential service, and it's a regulated monopoly. Now, you take Continental Telephone's proposal for the new town out in California. They're uh, proposing to build a whole fiber integrated system, and they're, allocate, they're proposing to allocate 50% of the cost of the fiber to the telephone users. Now that's 50%, and what will the customers be getting for it that they don't get without copper wire? Nothing. I mean, uh, so and it's those kinds of decisions that have to be made, and I'm concerned would be made uh, in using the telephone users' uh, telephone rates that they pay each month to subsidize a service that would be that would really put Mr. competition out of existence. Could, could you please move your microphone a little bit closer? And Sorry. Can I ask all the witnesses to please keep their microphones uh, Mr. President, I, I would simply ask you this. Uh, do you not have confidence in the ability of the state public service commissions and the Federal Communication Commission through rules that are already in effect and restated in the legislation that I've offered to police cross-subsidy and to do their job effectively? Well, I'm not an expert, but you heard Ms. Chambers this morning say that they can't do it. Gentleman's time has. Right. I, I thank the gentleman for his answers. Chair recognizes the gentleman from Colorado, Mr. Schaefer. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I thank members of the panel for taking the time and being here today. Uh, Mr. Devaney, you are representing the uh, National League of Cities and the Conference of Mayors. Is that correct? Uh, yes. One of the things that uh, is pushing this. Uh, re-regulation or the telco issue a lot has certainly been uh, talked about many times as a skyrocketing cost. You mentioned it in your uh, statements. How many cities are represented by the National League of Cities? I believe we have over um, some 16,000 municipalities, is that correct, uh, uh, that are represented in over 800 by the U.S. Conference of Mayors. About 16,000. Uh, in 1984, how many of those were hooked up to cable? I would not have, I, I'm, I'm not sure about that. Uh, what, what has been the average increase, what, what's hooked up the cable today? Some, somewhere over uh, 55 to 57 percent of the uh, residents are served by cable vision today. Okay. Uh, and now the skyrocketing costs is what I'm after. Uh, 1984, if you don't know how many were hooked up versus how many are hooked up today, I'd like to know what you're talking about in dollars or percents. I think in terms of cost, uh, Congressman, in just a two-year period, the average rate increase was over 29 percent for the consumer. In many cases, it has been in the hundred, uh, hundreds of percent increase, with some as high as 600 percent in increases. Uh, those types of, uh, of rate increases certainly affect the consumer and affect them very negatively, thereby preventing many people from from actually having cable vision I, I, in their home. I understand. This, this figure really came from the GAO report that we uh, were very familiar with last year. And this is in basic rates. Uh, this is not in uh, extra, extra rates. Now, right. the, the question I still have that I brought up before, we're talking basic rates that maybe were uh, $12 or $11 a month that now uh, have maybe raised $3 a month. So uh, we're not talking huge amounts of dollars. That's what I'm saying. And, and the other thing that I'm, a, I'm asking is, have you noticed an improvement in your cable service? Have you uh, seen where you, you get better service and more channels uh, with this increased cost? Congressman, certainly in many cases, I'm sure that there have been some increased channels. I think we have to look at the quality of those channels that have also been added versus the cost to the consumer. Uh, in many cases over the past few years, uh, it costs have increased faster than the consumer price index, which is the standard measure that we use in so many instances. And I think that we have to look at the cost in so many cities that have gone up uh, in, in, in measurable uh, quantities. And I think we have to look at the uh, benefit or the uh, versus the problems to the average person. Well, uh, just the, as long as you brought up this, uh, the consumer price index, uh, I think that uh, that average is 3.8, and uh, if I'm not mistaken, is that correct, David? Yeah, uh, 3.8, and, and for cable, and the, actually the CPI is 4.6, so uh, actually it's less than the uh, CPI. Uh, Mr. Gillette, uh, what uh, what is the that, and that's for 89, by the way? Uh, 
What's the cable industry doing now to uh, modernize? By the way, I welcome you here from the state of Colorado. Thank you. Uh, and improve uh, the signal quality uh, of the variety of services that it, it does provide. And you, you say you are deploying fiber optics now. And Absolutely. Yeah, it, fiber is, is being used in what we call our backbone architecture now, where we take fiber out to a, a remote site, very much similar to how telephone companies use fiber. And then we take a branch and tree network the rest of the way. The result of that is that the coax network into the house, which is very compatible with the existing TV uh, in the house, delivers a higher quality signal and delivers more channels to that customer. Uh, as we're also moving towards doing what we call a, a move towards conditional access. Uh, one of the challenges we've had is that as we grew our business, we had to put converter boxes out there in order to deliver more channels to the home. Uh, meanwhile, the consumer electronics industry picked up the, the pace and said, well, gee, we ought to have cable-ready TVs that don't need converter boxes. Now we had a conflict between the fact, let's get the converter box out of the house. So we're putting devices either on the side of the house or near the house that would allow easier for the customer to choose exactly what services they want and when they want it. Uh, it gives us a much more flexible ability for us to deliver new services to the house, and that also is being experimented with, matter of fact, in Colorado right now with the technology that may allow us to do that. Uh, and Mr. Bresnan, my final question before my time runs out, I, you've been talking about this competitive issue and that we, uh, the cable industry is really in com competition now. <coughs> Coming from where I do in Colorado, we have very heavy hookup in, in cable. Um, for example, my, I, my own home in Colorado has cable, my neighbor has a dish. So uh, that is uh, just a little bit indicative of, of what you're saying. Uh, what, I'm, uh, what I wanted to ask, um, Congress is concerned about ensuring that that cable service is provided to the rural areas, and I think that this is very important. Is the uh, cable industry also committed to serving the rural areas, do you feel? Yes, sir, and as a matter of fact, uh, uh, many of the cable companies are now wiring down to uh, 10 homes per route mile of cable. I've got several projects in my company uh, uh, where we're going down as low as five customers per mile. And uh, I'd like to point out, uh, just uh, uh, about a month or six weeks ago, we received a cable franchise in a little town of, uh, of Brimley, Michigan, uh, where a local telephone company, Chippewa Telephone Company, had held the franchise for two years and did not construct it. And we operate in Sault Ste. Marie, about 10, 12 miles away. They came to us and asked if we would build it, and, and we're in the process of building it. They granted us the franchise about six weeks ago, and we already are putting the lines on the pole, and we'll have it... Uh, energized this summer. Um, so uh, we're doing what, uh, in that case, they just talked about doing. And just repeat again, it was how many customers? In a we're, we have mile? a number of projects right now that we're building this year in our company that are as low as five customers per mile of plant. And it's very common nowadays to see cable systems build down to uh, 10 homes per mile. Thank you, Mr. President. Gentlemen. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Gentleman's time has expired. The chair recognizes the gentleman Ooh. from Louisiana, Mr. Tozan. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I want to direct all of you um, on the panel's attention to the small dish um, and obviously uh, compare it in size and dimension and shape to the large uh, satellite dish that's currently in use in most of the uh, uh, homes of America who have chosen this form of technology for cable uh, programming. And, uh, and also perhaps challenge the, uh, the committee to maybe sooner or later call together some of the players in Sky Cable and K-Prime to come tell us about their plans. And, and uh, it, I think you're planning to do that? We invited them Ooh. to this oh. uh, hearing, and they did not want to testify well, at this time. But they were, they were given a, keep an invitation, them. and we are going to uh, and, uh, create a forum in which they will be Thank invited. you, Mr. Chairman. And also possibly to get some Ooh. folks like GI uh, out in San Diego, who are developing uh, some of the uh, uh, the compression technologies that will compress more and more signals on a single transponder. I've seen some of that technology. I've seen the compression work in San Diego. Uh, I've seen, uh, for example, where they were able to compress several high-definition signals already on a single transponder. And the predictions are that uh, within the 93-94 framework, two of these, possibly three players, uh, could be ready to begin delivering these kinds of signals to American homes, rural and urban, all across America, whether they're wired up with telephones or cable, uh, the opportunity to receive those services on a dish no bigger than this flat dish sitting on the, on the uh, table up here. And uh, that those 
uh, KU band delivery uh, DBS to the home, uh, signals may include as many as 80 channels or more, including high definition channels. It's an exciting prospect. As we examine that possibility, I'm concerned about several things. One, if we do permit telco entry, and it's an option on the table we are seriously looking at, I think you've figured that out by now. Uh, and one of two things happen. Uh, the first is that it takes the nation till the year 2030, according to A. Greg Collins of Bell Atlantic, to have the nation wired up with fiber optics. That's uh, 2030 is what I have here. That will not happen at the current schedule pace domestically until 2030. Assuming you could update it a little bit. Let's say we cut it down in half. That's 20 years instead of 40. Uh, Sugar Land says we can get it, you can get it done in 10 to 15 years. My dad's 76. Uh, you, uh, you're going to get my drift in just a minute. Uh, I hope he makes it to 91. He's got a good shot. He's healthy and he's doing well. But, you know, getting him into the years 2010 and 2020 and 2030 without cable programming is asking a lot from him. And uh, while I'd love to see him around with us that long, I'm concerned about Dad and others who are waiting a long, long time and are still waiting <laughs> and uh, are anxious to see cable programming delivered to them at fair prices and then under competitive offerings. Uh, and anxious to see whether or not uh, these new technologies can give them some relief in the, in the meantime before somebody else comes along and does something uh, different. It seems to me this is a golden opportunity for us to develop some policy here in Washington that will open the door of this technology to folks like my dad and to that fellow I talked about in Fairfax County. And here we go. Here we go. If we allow telco entry and telcos, instead of choosing to wire up, decide simply to buy the cable company, you've got only one wire delivering video services in. Or if it takes them 10 to 15, 20 years to get that wire out there uh, on top of the cable wire or in the areas where it's not now serviced, it seems to me it would make good policy, would it not? And I'll ask any of you who feel like jumping into this thing with me. For us to develop in law today a system that guarantees that when this technology is available, that Americans have a chance to buy it from real third-party packagers, not necessarily connected or owned by the same people that produce the programs and own the cable. If we had that opportunity for Americans, like my dad, then conceivably within a few short years, he would have choice. He would either buy the cable if it's available to him under the terms and conditions set by the cable company or he could buy it delivered from a third party packager under fair marketing procedures we established and receive it on a small dish like this at his home in Chag Bay. Now if he had that choice, would we be as seriously concerned about regulating the cable as we are today? If my dad could tell the cable company, take your wire and bring it to somebody else's home. <laughs> I'm going to go with this guy because I can get better terms and better conditions out of it and better prices out of this guy, who is not the same guy as the owner of the cable. Wouldn't that work? And shouldn't we be exploring that possibility? Yes, sir. Well, I, I like the idea of competition. I'd love to have the opportunity to compete on a fair basis with the people that bring that satellite uh, into homes like you're talking about. I don't know why Congress doesn't open the game to full competition like we're pleading for and stop trying to handicap the different kinds of technologies and players. Wouldn't we be better off if all of us played on equal footing? Well, indeed we would, and that's why I say we're not mutually exclusive in our efforts here. There are concerns, however, with both technologies. Mr. Boucher has raised the, the, the problem that we've been waiting for this for seven years, and we're told now it's eminent and four years away. Us? I'm concerned about telco entry, even if it were allowed today, being 20 years away in Let's terms of full fiber optics. I'm hearing from some of you that fiber optics is not really the whole answer. It may not be the best technology. I'm hearing from, by the way, you, Mr. Brown, that uh, it's going to cost $300 billion to fiber optic up America. That's more than the entire asset base 
of all the telephone companies in America put together. And so I know there's some problems there. I'm concerned about uh, Ms. Chambers' testimony that if we have to spend another $300 million to fiber optic up America just so my dad can watch some television, that his telephone rates might have to double or triple as a result. And even worse than that, people who don't want to buy that television might find their rates going up as a consequence. Those are serious concerns you've raised. And the point I'm making is, while we address those serious concerns, try to work them out on a dual track, ought we not at the same time be developing policy that opens the door for this kind of competition to exist, for this technology to be delivered to Americans in somebody else's hands other than the same people that are delivering cable services to make sure that there's some fair marketing? Anybody want to take that? Mr. Congressman, yes, sir. the fact is, though, the bottom line is that people with dishes can get the service. They can get the service. I, I happen to have a country home in upstate New York, and, I, and there's no cable available. I have a dish like that in my, uh, in my yard, and I get the service, and I buy it. And I think originally those people, a lot of the dish people, were complaining that they actually had to pay for the service. And That's an old argument. Let's not make that okay. again. They but know they've got to pay for it. it. But you can what get they're it. concerned about is that they're paying the same person. They either got to pay the cable company or they got to pay the cable program supplier who happens to be owned by the cable company for the same programming. But they're getting the program. Oh, yeah, they're getting it. But your daddy can but get listen, the program. But let me make the point. If I only got one grocery store in town, it doesn't matter who's behind the counter. That one grocery store sets the prices on me. And the point I'm making is to you, sir, is that if I'm a satellite uh, choice home, I made that choice that for me to have real fair pricing, I got to have a choice of grocery stores. Mm, and price. all I'm suggesting to you is, is that if we have a policy in Washington oh, that says when this new grocery store opens up, there's going to be a different owner. There'll be fair marketing through third party packagers so that I can get some real choice going. Will not, will not I have the kind of competition that all of us have been preaching in this side of this panel? Well, thank God. In this country, we aren't regulating grocery stores. And well, unfortunately, we are. We just passed a price-fixing bill yesterday. <laughs> right. and, and, I don't, and I don't think it's any more appropriate, really, to, re to regulate this. I mean, these are, cre these are creative people that, have, that have, have invested venture capital to create programming, and they're selling it, and they're making it available just as cheaply to the dish owners as cable customers are buying it for. Gentleman's time has expired. Thank you, sir. Chair recognizes the gentleman from... Pennsylvania, Mr. Ritter. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Um, I'd like to uh, follow a, a line of questioning that uh, goes to the heart of some of these problems uh, that Mr. Devaney has talked about and that Ms. Chambers talks about the difficulty of, uh, of regulation. Uh, the Cable Act doesn't require uh, city franchises to, to sanction monopolies uh, and uh, it unfortunately doesn't uh, forbid uh, the granting of what are de facto monopolies and uh, I, I guess my question is who is responsible for such a situation turning into a monopoly with the ad in inherent uh, problems with with the consumers and the ratepayers who, who is it I mean is it Congress and the law? Is it the uh, cable industry? Is, is it the city franchisers? I mean, uh, what, 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 and then what, what needs to be done in, in order to uh, perhaps shift the legal requirements of the act so, so that uh, competition could be, be stimulated? Congressman, I think that the Cable Act of 1984 certainly uh, had greater expectations than we have come to realize and that I think that uh, the nation's uh, cities and other local governments have had to come back uh, to Congress and say that the competition was not there. And most of us are in agreement that the competition I, is my, not there. My question is, how come you don't grant more, more franchises? I think, we, I think we would, but the question now, or the fact of, of the matter is now, is that when you have cable systems uh, that are there, who else is going to come in if you grant the franchise when you're blocking out a very natural uh, competitor, when you have no appropriate uh, safeguards, when the act itself encourages uh, the refranchising with very little uh, safeguards and very few so, options So what you're, saying, what you're saying is 
city officials would grant additional franchises if they could, but the cable industry is delinquent, they won't come in and compete against another. Is that what you're saying? So it's the fault of the cable companies? I think it's the, the fault in, in many cases of those in the infancy of cable vision. When franchises were originally granted for long periods of time, for years and years, 20 years, when we were threatened in many cases that there would be no cable vision if we didn't grant franchises that were favorable. But you have the power. It's not, it's not 20 years ago, it's today. And, and you do have the power, or, or, or am I missing something? You do have the power to bring in a, comp a competing franchise. I think it's very difficult okay. under the Cable now, Act of, 80, uh, of, of 84. Because to, of what? All right. Now, the Cable Act is responsible. Why, why is that? What is it inherent in the Cable Act that pre prevents you from... Well, I mean, first I it's think the cable companies, now it's the Cable Act. And I think you have to, to look, beat on this. Congressman, at a, at a combination of what has occurred. We don't point to any one single entity and try to point all the blame or place all the blame. But I think a combination mm -hmm. of the law itself, as well as the the cable systems, the way they have established and the way they have grown in various communities and the way that they have blocked out they, the way uh, the, the uh, <clears throat> competitors with the franchise agreements that many cities have granted, many are not up for renewal or are just coming up for renewal. And we are learning the problems and but, the difficulties of re-regulation. But these are not exclusive franchises, are they? In some cases they are not exclusive. In some cases I'm sure that they uh, are. Uh, some have, uh, some cable companies have overbuilt um, mm -hmm. uh, in, in the local jurisdiction. Uh, it has effectively blocked competition one way or the other, and we simply don't have it. Okay. Um, so are you saying then that those cities that have granted uh, exclusive franchises to cable companies made a mistake and therefore need to be somehow bailed out of their situation by additional legislation? Well, I think that if some... Uh, cities uh, made mistakes and uh, certainly they can correct those mistakes uh, at the appropriate time when renewals come up but it still does not stop the deluge of consumer complaints and problems yeah, but, but I guess up. what I'm asking you is what is the answer to this deluge of consumer complaints and and I'm suggesting that perhaps it is the responsibility of the franchising authority to to seek some uh, competition uh, in, in the system and let's hear yeah. from Mr. Gillette, maybe. Congressman, I think there's another if I could factor respond, that's... Um, at the appropriate time, since it was directed to me, we are asking exactly for that opportunity in the testimony that I have presented to the committee, both oral and written. We are asking for the opportunity to provide appropriate safeguards uh, I am asking, to the No, consumer. I'm not asking about uh, regulatory safeguards. I am asking you whether or not you feel uh, it's important or essential to have uh, competition, and, and if, if you're somehow missing authority to, to, uh, to bring in that competition. We do feel it's important to have competition, any type of competition, with the appropriate safeguards to prevent many of the problems that have been demonstrated or stated here today involving the uh, telephone companies. And with those safeguards, we do support competition in every form. I, I think there's another factor working here in, instead of looking for a fault, and that is just a common economics problem. You cannot afford to build two networks and have two companies be in the business. So if you, if you want to provide choice of physical transport choice, I think you'll end up with a, with a disaster for the customer. The Cable Act tried to get programming choices to the customers, and in fact, in 1985, according to, to Nielsen, 19% of America had more than 30 uh, access to 30 channels, and today over 50, or let's see, what their number is, 51% are getting more than 30 channels. Programming choices have increased under the Cable Act. Customers have more choices. They don't care if they have two wires to the home. They want to have more programming, and that is exactly what has happened over the last few years as more and more programming has become available to America. So basically you're saying that the only physical transport choice, as I guess you're saying, the only real physical transport choice would be a telephone company. No, I disagree. I see. Even if telephone comes in to build, you have a duplicate capital investment trying to compete on insufficient funds for a market, and so the customer ends up suffering from that. We, they don't, we, they don't, we, don't we have some similar arrangements, though, in long-distance services where 
uh, we, we, we now have some dupl duplicate uh, facilities? Absolutely. And in the economics of a network where you have that much traffic density and you, you're able to compete and divide it up, when you're going directly to a home and you're wiring, you're, you're physically taking time to take a wire to each home, that's where it falls apart. You don't have two electric mm -hmm. wires to each home. You're not encouraging that to happen. And the economics of that simple network is the same thing as it is with telephone or cable. You do not have sufficient economics to take two physical wires to the home. Great, great, Collins. You want to take a shot at that? Well, I think it's an interesting point. I think well, one, I'd like to go back to the other point uh, also and say that uh, you know one of the reasons uh, the law isn't uh, working very well is because the cable guys are vertically oriented and have their programming tied up. So if you want to get into the field, what? Uh, you uh, you have a very difficult time uh, uh, getting stuff to put over it. I think that's one of the problems. The second one is I think there's a misrepresentation here that uh, it would take uh, 20 years for us to get into the uh, cable business and be effective competitors. That's really not the fact. The day you lift the uh, restrictions, we have the options to uh, take the network we have and upgrade it uh, with fiber, with coax, or with enhanced uh, copper. We'll Gentleman's be in the time. business immediately and have an effect. The gentleman from Pennsylvania's time has expired. The chair will now recognize the gentleman from Maryland, Mr. McMillan. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. As I uh, listen to these comments about competition uh, uh, with the telcos, uh, it's kind of interesting to look back at the, the history of uh, kind of an analogous telecommunication industry, the cellular industry, where the intent when cellular was introduced was to provide competition by having two providers, a non-wireline and a wireline. But as we've seen the development over time, the Bells throughout the country have ended up owning both sides, both the non-wireline, which was intended to be that kind of entrepreneurial uh, non-Bell company, and then, and then the wireline, uh, the phone companies. But as we've seen happen, although there are exceptions to that rule, there's been a a lot of bells on both sides of the cellular question. My question is, uh, if you allow the telcos into, into cable, uh, would, that, uh, would that be the, the result downstream that you would have the phone companies buying up a lot of the cable operators and uh, really uh, owning both sides of this throughout the country? Go ahead. Well, certainly, uh, that and, and would not the be second, second part of the question is, that would that be in the best interest of the consumers? No, I doubt if that would be in the best interest. I think what we want here is a fully competitive marketplace. We want that satellite technology, we want the cable companies, and I think we want the telephone companies in. And uh, I believe uh, that really what we're talking about is the increased supply of, of programs, uh, new innovative services, a two-way network that the telephone companies would provide. There's. Uh, I believe an opportunity for us to do the billing and simplified uh, gateway kinds of uh, access to TV services. Those are the kinds of things we're talking about. But we, but, will bring insurance to that. But with the vertical integration that has occurred with programming and cable, if you carry the cellular analogy forward, wouldn't you have the Bells having a complete vertical integration of uh, programming and, uh, and the uh, conduit into the home? The cellular analogy, don't forget now that half of the frequency is supplied to the non wireline carrier. But a lot of the non wirelines are owned by the Bells. That's true. That's what competition is all about. What my point is, is but that... They're not, owned, they're not owned where the telephone company, they're not owned where the telephone company operates. But my, my point is, is the natural progression of the Bells getting in the cable is that you will have the Bells owning both sides and having a vertical integration where they own the programming as well. Uh, isn't that a, isn't that a, uh, if you're looking out, out to the future, isn't that a possibility? It's a possibility. I don't think it's a reality. The fact a anybody, would you like to comment? Yeah, Mr. Collins, I'd like to kind of follow up on, on the description we had here of, of Bell Atlantic encouraging cable companies to continue to exist, satellites to, 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 to continue to exist, so there'd be competition for the video marketplace. So in other words, they will get a portion of our current business, which is a, a total of about $15 billion. So according to the numbers that have been talked about, they want to spend 200 to $400 billion in order to compete for a portion of a $15 billion business. That does not make economic sense at all. Well, I, I just, you know, I, I was just trying to get a, a viewpoint here as to whether that's good public policy or, or what, uh, looking at the progression as what has happened in the cellular industry, and I was just curious as to your thoughts. The other question I had 
You know, notwithstanding what the gentleman from Louisiana said about competition uh, in the near term, uh, it's clear that there probably won't be significant market share competition in the near term, and that's several years away. So we are looking at, in my view, some sort of interim rate re regulation. If that occurs at the federal level with some kind of CPI index formula with a, a rate adjustments for program enhancements, kind of a pass-through provision, um, wouldn't that, in essence, um, make competition downstream even more problematic because you would be encouraging and enhancing that vertical integration? If cable can basically pass on programmatic enhancements downstream to the consumer, don't you have the don't you have a continued evolution towards more integration, which would make competition, when it does come around, even more problematic? Is that a, anyone want to take a stab at that? Yes, if we are kept out for another uh, five years, then of course they'll get even more entrenched, and we're going to delay the development and deployment of the fiber network that you want. But my, my point is, is if you're allowing rate adjustments for programmatic enhancements, what you're doing is you're passing the cost right down to the consumer, and you are encouraging that vertical integration. That's going to happen, and I don't know how you deal with that unless you can... Uh, well, in addition to that, you've got these cable companies who've got an um, uh, embedded value of $500 per loop, selling for $2,500 per loop, and in increasing the total cost and price to the customers. Mm -hmm. So you've got that going on too, all that money. Where's that money going? Back into investment of programming and new technologies, or is it going into pockets of the owners? Do would someone from the cable industry respond on that? Please? Congressman, uh, on, on the uh, vertical integration issue, I think that that's a, a very critical point in that vertical integration brings with it some bene potential benefits and some, pe some potential risks. And we certainly recognize that. The fact is, though, that if the cable industry were not vertically integrated, most of the cable services that you see today on, on cable would not be available, just would not have happened. I know. But I do recognize that at some point in time, if you allow a large enough entity to vertically integrate, you can have some serious, the, the, the risks start to outweigh the potential benefits. And I think that when you allow a monopoly essential service provider to use its monopoly profits to cross-subsidize and vertically, vertically integrate and compete with a, uh, a, a free market type enterprise, uh, you run into some very serious potential risks. I think that's... Uh, my that's question really was getting out to the crux of, you know, rate re-regulation, something's coming along that line. I mean, it seems to be, we seem to be heading that way, but how do you do so without, you know, this pass-through that just encourages more and more vertical integration? I just, I mean, that's, I mean, you'll answer the telcos getting in, but I'm not sure that's going to that's going to be the interim's short-term solution. Anyway, that's really the uh, extent of my question. Thank you, Mr. Chief. The gentleman from Maryland's time has expired. The chair recognizes the gentleman from the state of Virginia, Mr. Bliley. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Collins, uh, does Bell Atlantic want to be able to become a CATV operator inside its region? Uh, yes, uh, Congressman Bliley, we would like to do that. We believe it would benefit the consumers. But I want to also point out that our primary interest is in developing the network that be available not only for our cable function, but for other cable functions, broadcasters, and it would be a two-way system. We're really primarily interested in making sure that that network develops. Uh, is Bell Atlantic interested in uh, creating CATV programs? Uh, yes, we are. We, our primary interest is not in replacing what is today available, but uh, to creating new types of programs, particularly in the education and medical environments. Uh, we'd like the opportunity, which we're prohibited from doing to now, to even uh, participating as a, as a partner or a joint venturer. Why haven't you be uh, become a CATV operator abroad? Well. Our primary focus is to uh, enhance the network in the Bell Atlantic region uh, for the customers, all of the customers in our region. That doesn't preclude or prevent us or suggest that we might not look at an opportunity overseas where there are more freedoms to operate than there are here, but we've not chosen to do that yet. Mayor Devaney, uh, welcome to our committee. Thank you. Uh, as a former mayor and a former board member of the National League of Cities, it's nice to have you with us. Thank you. You uh, 
support this legislation as a group? Is that right? We do support the uh, legislation uh, with the safeguards that we feel would be appropriate to uh, address some of the I concerns. That have I been understand heard. that. Uh, you have cable in Augusta? Yes, we do. Uh, what is the franchise fee the cable operator pays you? Uh, it is a relatively low amount uh, in the uh, uh, thousands of dollars, approximately 45. What percentage? Um, What's the percentage? Of homes that are served. No, the percentage of the fee. Oh, five. Uh, five percent. percent. Yes. Okay. If Bell South is allowed to come in that, would you expect to collect a uh, franchise fee from them? Yes, sir, we would. Mr. Collins, if you are allowed to come into Richmond with C&P, would you expect to pay a franchise fee to the city equal to that paid by Continental? Well, I'll tell you, we will support the USTA position that uh, we ought to pay and conform uh, in our cable operations to the same rules that the cable people uh, comply with. You're a great fisherman, Mr. Collins, but that bait won't catch your fish. Now, answer the question. Uh, do yeah. you, uh, would you expect to come in under the same terms and condition as your competitor. In other y words, yes. they, if they have to pay a franchise fee, would you expect to pay the same? Yes, I said we would. Okay. Now, whether or not they need 5% from both of us or 2.5% from the others is a I question. don't think you get the mayor to support you on that. Well, I would, <laughs> I would sure try, sir. Well, I bet you would. <laughs> you might lose some more that half in the process. Uh, we, a number of years ago, this, this committee had to adopt legislation to require uh, that telcos uh, supply pole attachments at a reasonable fee for the cable operators to wire. Would you, I mean, could we expect that uh, you would continue to do that or would, uh, or you know, or would we possibly run the risk, as as uh, the CATV operators would say, that as soon as you got into it, you would jerk away the pole attachments? We have legislation that requires that uh, we provide uh, those pole attachments at reasonable rates. We would continue to perform that. As a matter of fact, it's in our self-interest to have all cable suppliers use our poles, conduits, cable facilities, on an equal basis that our subsidiary would use it. That leads me to the next question. Uh, if you are allowed to do this uh, with the proper safeguards in a separate subsidiary, would you provide the same access to the fiber optic cable to the TV, cable TV operator at the same rate as, as you would charge your subsidiary? Our belief is that the facilities that would be provided to our subsidiary would be identical in type, kind, and price, and that would be our intent. We believe the FCC would enforce that. You would also set up a separate subsidiary not to be subsidized from uh, the, your regulated monopoly? Yes, we would set up a separate subsidiary for the cable company for the cable functions of a cable company. Do you uh, support the current must-carry rules as they currently exist? I'm not sure I understand all of the must-carry rules, but I'll guarantee you that whatever rules you pass that uh, apply to the cable operation would apply to our cable operation. Thank you very much, Mr. Collins. You've been most forthcoming. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Great. Gentlemen's uh, time has expired. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Tennessee, Mr. Cooper. Thank you, Chair. I want to make five quick and distinct points. First, uh, the trouble continues. Even though cable companies are under great national scrutiny in my congressional district, they're still continuing their lengthy track record of abuse. I'd like to ask unanimous consent to insert in the record two newspaper articles, one from the Scott County Independent Herald, Senator Howard Baker's home county. The headline reads, Cable Company Suspends Further Line Expansion Projects. Blackmail is what one commissioner calls action by BSF Cablevision. I'd also like to insert from the other end of my district, from the Winchester Herald Chronicle, 
an article entitled, Competition Needs Seen for Cable Television. Without objection, the materials which the gentleman from Tennessee wishes to have inserted will be placed in the record at the appropriate point. Second point. When I co-sponsored the Bouncer Bill, I really hadn't envisioned a serious prospect of MFJ legislation passing. I still hope I don't have to envision that serious prospect. <laughs> but I think it's important that as we consider the Boucher Bill, we focus on the need not to replace one monopoly with another, but to have competition, which should be the goal of all of us so that we can get cheaper prices and better quality for our consumers. I, for one, and many of my colleagues share my feeling fear that due to cross-subsidy and various other telephone advantages that uh, without MFJ's type restraints or safeguards, we may well have to write them uh, into uh, voucher type legislation. So I just want to make, make that caveat. Another point, reading Mr. Bresnan's testimony couldn't help but be a little bit upset because although he didn't say it explicitly, I thought he tried to come across as small time cable and pro satellite dish. When, Mr. President, it's my understanding that you're not just a partner, you're virtually wholly owned by TCI. Isn't that correct? They own 50, uh, 41, 49 percent of my company. I own 51 percent of it, and I am the managing partner. <laughs> managing partner. <laughs> well, because the track record of a company like TCI hasn't exactly been exemplary in promoting rural uh, cable television, in my opinion. It certainly hasn't been exemplary in promoting my colleague Mr. Tozan's goals of fairer access to satellite TV signals. and um, So I just couldn't help but think that your testimony seemed to me at least to be a little disingenuous. It would have been helpful to this committee if it had been clearly stated at the beginning of your testimony the business relationship you have with a giant MSO like TCI so that we could have a better handle on, on your perspective. And perhaps you're fully independent from them. Perhaps they never look at your books. I hope for your sake that's true but I doubt it. There was, uh, there was never any intent to be disingenuous. I think it's, it's, it's widely known in the industry what the ownership structure of my company is. Might be widely known in the industry, but we're not in the industry up here. We need to be fully informed by our witnesses. Another point. <clears throat> it seems to me there are a couple of ways to get telephone companies in the business. One is the broad voucher type approach. Another approach would be to just dramatically expand the rural exemption. Uh, since most of my rural communities are not served by the Bells but by small telephone companies, that's another tack that I think that we should be exploring so that communities up to 50 or 100,000 people have the freedom to uh, have real competition and invite their local telephone company into the business. Final point, uh, a number of folks apparently today in the hearing have been concerned about the appearance of looking like re-regulators. Well, I prefer competition myself. I think ideally that's the way to go. But being practical, there are a lot of smaller communities where even the local telephone company is not going to be interested in getting into the business. It's not lucrative enough. And in those situations, I think we have to be frank with ourselves and say, if we want fairer prices for consumers, somebody is going to have to have the courage to step in and regulate. Now, that's not fun. That's not popular. But until each market is lucrative enough, for overbuild or for wireless cable or for something like that. We don't want to leave out most of America just because we're afraid in this committee to mention the word re-regulate. As I said, it's not my first choice. I'd rather have competition everywhere. But, and I'm not necessarily saying that local rate regulation is the best way to go, but that's at least what we've had some limited experience with. And in view of headlines such as those that we're continuing to get in Tennessee, um, I think that we need to go ahead and face up to the truth that we're going to leave out at least most of rural America unless we consider some type of re-regulation possibility. Those were my five points. I appreciate the indulgence of the chair. Thanks. Thank you, gentlemen. Gentlemen's uh, time has expired. The chair will recognize itself for uh, another very brief round of questions. And what I'd like to ask each of you is if you agree that just for the sake of this discussion, that the telephone companies would be allowed into the cable industry. Would you then agree that they should be prohibited from purchasing the existing cable systems within individual communities so that we could be sure 
that they built competing competitive systems rather than, rather than just replace the existing monopoly with a new one. So just could you just please answer yes or no, Mr. Mayor. Mr. Chairman, our or, neither organization has a specific policy in response to that from uh, uh, personally I feel that there should be some some type of safeguard against it, but that would be my personal opinion can you, as a Can mayor. you have your organization please give us your answer, yes uh, or no? Will, yeah, yes, okay. uh, Mr. Chairman, we'll go back to our membership. Right, thank you. Mr. Collins? Clear, no, we should not be prevented from buying a uh, facility, and I would like the opportunity to explain why when we get when you get the rest of the answers. Maybe. Okay. Well, uh, we might not have time. That's just that's very helpful, though, Mr. No. Brown. No. No. Okay. Fine. Carolyn Chambers. We've only addressed the regulatory questions concerning the phone company, so we haven't we don't have a policy on that either. Okay, Mr. Gillette. Yeah, Mr. Chairman, I have to pass to the NCTA on that because that's not an area that I can. Can answer. Okay, and I just do the you. technology planning. I, I can't really tell you, sir. I, it, that's a very uh, important and basic question, and I, I can't make a decision like that sitting here. I think, I think our listening American audience is absolutely thrilled with the commitment this panel has to competition in our country and, uh, and the entrepreneurial spirit, which was just displayed by already existing mon uh, monopolies on uh, both areas of American telephonic and cable services, but. Uh, I guess that is, for its own purpose, a, Mr. A, a helpful illustration of the preliminary stage of discussion which this issue uh, is actually in right now. Mr. Chairman, my idea of purchasing a uh, in-place, in-region uh, company would not be for monopolistic purposes. I would buy it with the condition that I upgraded it to a network that all could use as quickly as possible. And it would accelerate the opportunity to get that network in place if I were able to do it. I do understand that. And uh, I'm sure that the cable industry would be more than willing to guarantee that they'll upgrade their network and give access to all as well yeah, if we gave them the would. proper incentives. Mm -hmm. But the, the point of this whole discussion, of course, as you know, is whether it be satellite dishes, uh, whether it be the telephone companies, or any other uh, uh, means by which we would get uh, new programming into people's homes that would not uh, uh, result in having a single provider uh, in that community. Um, and, uh, you just want to kind of reach out and touch us again? Is that <laughs> uh, uh, and, uh, I, I might, I might that's add... That's not that, a regional company, that's another company. <laughs> <laughs> I, I might add that... Um, that, that that would be completely unacceptable to the chair if that was a formulation that anyone felt was uh, going to uh, be proceeding down the legislative track. E either we're building for competition or we, uh, we, we have some different kind of a discussion that we're, we would be engaging in, but it wouldn't have anything to do with competition as far as I'm concerned. Um, and um, let, me, uh, let me ask as well, in, in terms of the cost allocation, uh, Mr. Brown, that would exist uh, between the uh, telephonic and the cable services which you would be uh, providing uh, in terms of the installment of a new fiber uh, network. How would you divide those costs uh, between the, uh, the cable and the uh, telephonic services? The, uh, uh, the FCC and the, the Texas Public Utilities Commission would have a big hand in telling me how to divide the cost. Uh, basically, we would, we would make sure that uh, rates were, remain stable local service rate. And how would you allocate them? Uh, how I'm told. How you're told. That's right. All right. What do you think would make some sense in terms of fairness? Would you split it 80-20, 50-50? I have no way of saying that right no now. No way of saying I, I believe, the, Mr. Chairman, I believe the new form of regulation where we uh, have a price cap negates the need for the costly allocations, which would be, as you are indicating, somewhat arbitrary. If once you stabilize the prices for local services, you're not afforded the opportunity to raise those to cross-subsidize this entry, I think that issue and need for, cross, for cost studies is eliminated. It's eliminated. And a whole lot of uh, cost work and, and uh, overhead and regulatory, regulatory activity is eliminated. You could see, though, where under a price cap scenario there might be some difficulty in differentiating uh, uh, between the uh, the various cost allocation internally the company would make in terms of how it would be trying to undercut uh, its various competitors in the, in the numerous industries that it would be seeking to compete with simultaneously. And it would, uh, it would uh, definitely make it more complex in terms of our ability to uh, monitor that. Um, let, me, uh, let, me, let, me, let me finish up by saying this, that 
uh, each of you could be extremely helpful if uh, you could give us your one minute uh, s summation statement to us with regard to what principles you want us to retain as we go through this discussion. Mr. Mayor, especially you, uh, in terms of the, uh, the balance that would exist between uh, regulation of the existing cable industry uh, pending the introduction of the, the new uh, competition that would be coming into the marketplace um, and, um, uh, and how that, uh, that balance should be struck of existing legislation during a transition period and incentives, a package of incentives put in place in order to uh, give the, uh, the right um, a set of, uh, of, of uh, spurs to these uh, new ways of, uh, of getting programming into people's homes. And I'd like you each think of that because at the end of the hearing, at the end of this panel, we're going to give you a chance to make that summation statement. But I, I note that uh, the gentleman from New Mexico, um, Mr. Richardson, uh, has arrived. And before we end this panel, I would like to um, uh, give him an opportunity uh, to ask a round of questions if that is his desire. And so I would ask the gentleman if he seeks recognition at this time, and if he does, he is recognized for uh, five minutes to, uh, to, pr to uh, proceed in any fashion that he sees fit. Mr. Chairman, thank you. And I know everyone's muttering, and when they saw me walk in, said, oh, geez, I thought that was not going to be the last one. But I do want to ask you some You do look questions. a little bit like Della Street in a Perry Mason uh, uh, <laughs> series. So. I want to thank the chairman and all the members of the committee for voting for my bill today. That was a reason for my absence. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I'd like to direct my question to uh, uh, Mr. Collins from Bell Atlantic, if I could. And, and the question I want to ask Mr. Collins is, is related to an interest that I have, and that's uh, EEO issues, minority contracting, uh, the question is if the telephone industry is, is permitted to enter the cable business, would you be willing to accept the, sta the same statutory EEO obligations uh, for, for your cable operations that are currently imposed on cable operators? And as you answer that question, I want you also to supply for the record uh, the EEO records of not just uh, Bell Atlantic, but if, if a composite could be made as to what kind of EEO records you have vis-a-vis -vis the cable industry. That's a very important barometer for me and uh, for I know other members of, of this committee, Mrs. Collins and Mr. Towns. And we are working on legislation uh, uh, on EEO relating to the broadcasting industry. And we would obviously want to apply it across the board. But Mr. Collins, uh, what would you be prepared to do in this area? Uh, well, to start with, uh, Bell Atlantic is not a beginner in uh, dealing with uh, EEO regulations and compliance. And as a matter of fact, we've been doing it even before Bell Atlantic uh, was formed. Uh, we have complied, passed all the tests. Uh, we're very proud of our record. Uh, we have a uh, affirmative action programs for females and minorities and as well as the uh, veterans of the Vietnam era. So Bell Atlantic would accept, I, I assume the statutory requirements are about the same as we have in other legislation. Uh, we would certainly want to operate on an equal basis with uh, the cable companies. So I, with uh, the option to check the actual legal statutory requirements, I, in principle I accept what you're talking about. As you get to the industry, uh, situation is my understanding that uh, more than 14 percent of all the telephone company uh, industry employees are black while just about 10.5 uh, percent of the cable employees are black. Uh, we have uh, ethnic minorities constitute 13 percent of our management and professional employees in the telephone industry and it's about 10 percent for the same kind in the uh, cable industry. Uh, I believe we have a fine record compared uh, with the cable industry and we're prepared to maintain and plan to sustain that record. Um, well, I'm going to direct my second question to you, too, also. It, it deals with, uh, is your company interested in providing uh, video to the home over fiber uh, and or the coaxial cable? And if so, why would you choose either one or both? Well, 
we are interested in building a broadband network to the home. We're going to use the most economic uh, technology that's available at that particular time. We, for, we see now, with the state of technology where it is today, to take the fiber probably to within 100 or 1,000 feet of a home. And then at that point, we would have the option of using enhanced copper with the new electronics. We could use coax or we could use fiber. It will depend really on, and it will change, I think, over time as new technology and new electronics are developed. Now, uh, am I, and, and I apologize for being in so late, or, would you also qualify as the USTA representative in this panel? I am on the board of directors of USTA, but I'm executive vice president of Bell Atlantic. Okay. So I'll speak for both. <laughs> Let me ask you, let me ask you the, the final question. I know, Mr. Chairman, you're anxious to go to the next uh, panel. Uh, now, if, if telcos provide uh, video programming, uh, would this programming uh, contain advertising? Who, who would sell this advertising? Well, uh, I would guess, Al, if we had a kit, we agreed, you weren't here earlier, we agreed that uh, one condition of our entry might be a separate subsidiary for the cable function, and that would be the uh, programming and uh, content development if we did that. And we would assume that that function, like any other uh, cable provider, would be in the advertising uh, business if it was needed, if the revenues were needed, and if it was a competitive necessity. I think the marketplace is going to determine whether you need advertising on that uh, cable service. Mr. Is it Gillette? Yeah. Gillette, is there anything you want to add on this issue? Or uh, maybe I should also ask you about the EEO standards and cable television. We put that in the bill in the, in the last act. And uh, I know you're making progress, but not as rapidly as myself and others want. Uh, do you want to deal with that issue in terms of uh, cable's responsibilities to EEO and EE and, uh, minority contracting and minority operators in your business? I, I'll uh, yield my time to Mr. Bresnan to answer that. <laughs> Is he your lawyer? <laughs> no. no. <laughs> I'm just a cable operator. But uh, I think the cable industry has, has made good strides. You're right that there are some that uh, remain to uh, make it better improvements. And uh, as an industry, we are definitely committed in, in all areas, in uh, supply, vendors, contractors, employees, uh, management uh, level. You know, I am pleased with uh, Cable's response, at least to some of the other concerns on the issue of servicing and pricing. You, you have taken some internal steps, mm -hmm. and, and I think that's positive. And, and I think it's important that you follow through on this uh, EEO issue. I but I'm with pleased you. with the Bell Atlantic answer. I sense you may have been reading from the script, but what you said was that you would be willing and, and you would probably encourage me to pursue strong EEO standards in any legislation affecting you. Is that right, Mr. Yes, uh, we accept that. That's great. Right. Gentlemen's time has expired. Any other members seeking recognition at this time? Then let us, let us then ask each of you to give us your uh, one minute uh, a summary of what it is that you want us to uh, retain as we go through this debate. Can we start with you, Mr. President? We'll give you one minute apiece. Please try to be concise and to the point. Uh, in this country, we've always been concerned with the possibility of cross-subsidization by an essential monopoly service subsidizing a competitive service. And I think that th those concerns, of course, were, were uh, explored when, uh, the, uh, in a, mo a nonpartisan way, this government chose to break up uh, AT&T. And it uh, specifically uh, required that those uh, uh, separations between program content and conduit uh, uh, be kept separate. And those concerns exist today uh, as much as they ever did, in fact, even more so, because you can see that uh, uh, just in recent uh, weeks, there's been a number of cases of cross-subsidization and other questionable business practices. So I think that the concerns are there. I don't believe you've heard uh, the representative Nehruk, uh, I don't believe that, uh, that there's any way to po properly police cross-subsidization. Okay. Thank you, Mr. President. Mr. Gillette. 
Uh, thank you. I, I, it seems to me that technology sometimes can distract us from what is, should be the goal of what we should be talking about and attempting to achieve, and that is serving American homes. And in thinking of services, I think there's three categories of services. And one is talking on your telephone, one's watching television, and then we have this magical one called information that we all are trying to make happen. The two first are what I will call mega services. Every home in America essentially has both of those. If you carefully analyze each of them, it turns out that, it, it, that they have such significant different characteristics that the optimum network to serve each of those are different. And we have an obligation to our existing customers to reduce the cost of their existing products. I mean, we had an offer from Bell Atlantic to stabilize rates for telephone. Well, it seems to me if fiber is supposed to do all the great things it's supposed to do, we should be lowering rates of telephone service. On the information side, I don't know of any information service from my experience either at GTE or what I've been working on for the last year with cable labs that cannot be done through our existing infrastructures, and we should get on with those services and let them benefit America now. Okay, thank you. Ms. Chambers. Uh, I'd like to reiterate, excuse me, that the association has not taken a position for or against lifting the cross-ownership restrictions. But we perceive a number of risks that we feel merit case-by-case uh, -case assessment uh, or market-by-market -market assessment of the uh, appropriateness of letting, tele letting telephone companies provide cable service. I just want to go back to a point that was raised earlier by Congressman Boucher. I think the fact that electric utilities and telephone companies are providing cable television over separate facilities is essentially irrelevant to this debate. We're talking here about providing cable services over the same facilities that provide uh, basic telephone service. And that's where regulators perceive the biggest risk. And uh, I don't mean to suggest that we, we don't think that there are some safeguards that might work. I think that there are some regulators who probably feel that they could adequately police uh, cross-subsidization in certain markets. But we don't have enough confidence to support lifting the cross-ownership restriction across the board. Thank you very much, Ms. Chambers. Um, Mr. Brown. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I would uh, I would like to, to say one thing very quickly about the cross-subsidy issue. My, my companies are audited 11 times a year by various state and federal entities, and to suggest that I can cross-subsidize is lu ludicrous. Small telephone companies inherently are concerned about their customers. I have people in my service area that can't get cable television. I want to provide it. Most small companies think about their customers first, and that is the thought of most small companies that I know of in the USA. Thank you, Mr. Brown. Mr. Collins. Uh, large companies think about their customers first also. They pay the bill. I'd like to urge this committee to uh, adopt a policy of competition and not attempt a quick fix on a re-regulation effort. Uh, I think that uh, we have an opportunity here for, to improve the uh, de deployment of a fiber network as needed for this nation to be competitive. There are no incentives in today's new regulatory uh, structure for us to cross-subsidize. We are heavily audited, and I think that will prevent it. We should not delay or miss the opportunities before you today to create a competitive marketplace. I urge you to do that. If you don't let the telephone companies in now, Mr. Chairman, I'll be back every year and probably have legislation requested for you in the next five years to remove those restrictions. Thank you. Yeah. Hopefully I'll be here in five years. And, uh, I hope I am too. <laughs> uh, Mr. Mayor De Devaney. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I don't think that uh, the nation's cities are asking for regulation just for the sake of regulation or to take on unwarranted problems. However, it is the consumer that comes to us at the local level on a regular and steady basis asking for protection and asking us for answers, answers that we cannot give. The facts show that the rates of Cablevision have increased three times the consumer price index in just the past few years, and that the FCC and the courts have not uh, given the intent of the 1984 Cable Act. Testimony here today also stated that the FCC and state regulatory bodies have not been as responsive as we would like to see. We would like to see some measure of local control while competition is established to ensure that the consumer is protected and to put the regulatory authority back where the companies operate, and that is at the local level. Our concern is to respond to our constituents and not keep telling them to write Congress. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for the opportunity to appear before your subcommittee. Thank you, uh, Mr. Mayor, very much. And uh, you and your co-panelists this morning are key players in any legislation which we would pass this year. 
I can tell you that uh, the clear sense of the subcommittee uh, is that uh, legislation uh, will be moving this year, and we're going to need all of you uh, to play uh, very vigorous roles in this uh, ongoing discussion. So I would ask you to stay close to the subcommittee, to the members, uh, because we're going to need your ongoing advice and uh, guidance as uh, we deliberate. Uh, but uh, we thank you very, very much, and uh, with the thanks of the subcommittee, uh, you can go to lunch. Uh, but the second uh, panel that we have uh, right now is equally distinguished and deserves the, uh, the attention of, uh, of our audience and the subcommittee. And uh, it consists of Mr. Matthew uh, Aristano, who is the president of Omni Microwave Television, uh, Mr. Winston Cox, who is Chairman and Chief Executive Officer of Showtime Networks. Uh, Mr. Uh, B.R. Phillips III, who is Chief Executive Officer of the rural, rural, National Rural Telecommunications Cooperative Association. Uh, Mr. John S. Hendricks, who is Chairman and Chief Executive Officer of the Discovery Channel. Uh, Mr. William J. Ray, Superintendent of Glasgow Electric Plant Board. Uh, testifying on behalf of the American Public Power Association, and Mr. Gordon D. Maine from Maine Electronics Company, testifying as chairman of the Satellite Broadcasting and Communications Association of America. Um, I'd like to uh, note, if I could, uh, that the satellite dish uh, that uh, we have been uh, using as a display here, that is the larger one, um, was uh, provided for our subcommittee by the, uh, to our subcommittee by Davis Antenna, uh, which is located in Waldorf, uh, Maryland, and the subcommittee would like to thank them for their um, help. Uh, in addition, the smaller uh, satellite dish uh, was provided to us by Hughes Communication, one of the partners in the Sky Cable Consortium, and uh, although uh, they are not testifying before us today, uh, Hughes Communications um, does want to participate in uh, subsequent uh, hearings which we are going to have on this and related subjects. So uh, let us now move on to uh, this subcommittee, and uh, if we could, we'll start with uh, Mr. Oristano and uh, ask if you could to uh, give us your opening remarks. Uh, please try to um, uh, restrict them to uh, a five minute period and as you can see there's plenty of interest on the part of the members of the subcommittee. Thank you Mr. Chairman. Uh, while we're all uh, showing off antennas, I thought it would also be appropriate to show off an antenna that's here today and available to serve subscribers today in markets that total many millions of homes if we could just get the programming. I haven't measured this against a napkin, but it looks more or less the right size to me. Uh, and this is what uh, competition can bring today. And whose dish is that, sir? This, this is not a, a dish. This is a conifer uh, wireless cable antenna. Gentlemen, my name is Matt Oristano, and I'm the president of Omni Microwave and chairman of PCTV Partners, People's Choice TV. We hold wireless cable frequency rights across the country and hope one day to be a wireless cable multiple system operator. The company has been in wireless since 1986. I'm here to talk in general terms about issues covered in the written testimony submitted by Mr. Joseph Hippel, whose place I'm taking today. Mr. Chairman, I'd ask that those comments be submitted to the record. Without uh, objection, all of the written comments uh, or testimony of all the witnesses will be inserted in the record. Thank you. My family company has been in the cable business from 1966 to 1989. We built systems in Florida, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, and Connecticut. And I guess you could call me sort of a cable baby because it's the only business I've ever been in all my life. We sold our U.S. cable holdings in 1984 and later decided to enter wireless cable. When we began, we were certain that as cable operators who had a long and profitable history and who had paid millions of dollars to programmers, that we would quickly be able to secure the programming that was necessary to launch our systems. 
Gentlemen, nothing was further from the truth. Some programmers, a brave few, such as Discovery or BET, dealt with us right away on the same terms and conditions as they did with cable. But the key services, the ones without you just cannot launch a pay television system, would not deal. Never mind the fact that in the 70s and 80s we were entrepreneurs together with these people, or that they had made millions from us previously, or that by dealing with us we would increase their penetration to the marketplace. Fact is that after five years of working on the project, People's Choice TV today stands still without national contracts for essential programming, including ESPN, Showtime, TNT, Disney, Prime Sports, and Sports Channel. Now, let's be clear about the way programming access works. If I were Joe Schmo and I didn't have a nickel to my name, and I had a cable franchise for 500 homes in Pascagoula, I could call any of these services and get a contract sent that day by some low-level functionary on standard terms and conditions. But when I talk about wireless cable, all the bets are off. The excuses multiply, the people don't answer the phone calls, we get the brush off by the same companies that begged us for access to our cable systems. Now, sometimes I hear artfully crafted rationales that I never heard when I was in cable about why I can't get service on fair terms. But sometimes I hear the truth. We can't get the service because they're protecting the cable operators. Even a major independent programmer told me they were protecting the cable operators. My partners and I have invested $20 million of our own money in this business to date and we can't get into operation yet because we can't get the programming. Let me give you an idea of what we're ready to do. We hold frequencies, generally about 20 per market, enough to launch a 25 to 30 channel service in the following cities. Chicago, Minneapolis, St. Louis, Baltimore, Kansas City, and Tucson. These markets contain about seven and a half million homes and we could have been serving the first of these two years ago. They're ready to launch, except for programming. Some cable programmers will come before you in these hearings and give you lots of buzzwords to convince you that they're negotiating with the wireless cable industry. And they'll say they're reviewing our requests for programming on a case-by-case -case basis. And they'll cite all kinds of concerns, concerns that none of them has for even the most inept cable operator. In our case, some of these negotiations have led to contracts that we never would have had to accept in the cable industry. In one major market, a premium sports service controlled by a cable operator insisted that if People's Choice TV achieves more than a 2% penetration in that market, they have the right to terminate the contract. Now, there you have it. That's the cable industry's view of effective competition. In our Sacramento system, the one market we were able to launch because we just happen to have a cable franchise, we've achieved a very high penetration marketing against the cable operator in just four months of operations by charging ten dollars a month less than he does as a result turner network television has said they're going to cut off our service do we need your help you bet we do do we need a handout no we'll find the money to build this new industry we just need the product to sell to the viewing public as the cable operators cried for your help in fighting the network chokehold over the TV viewers, so do we seek exactly the same help in combating the cable monopoly. And please be aware, we need a little bit more than just programming availability. Some bro programming services have made their wares available to us, but only like King George made tea available to the colonies. They'll kill us with special fees and restrictions, like ESPN, which is available to us, but only in the areas without cable. All we want is to be able to get the same contract that any cable operator can get with one phone call. We suggest you let the FCC regulate and enforce for some period which may sunset what are fair terms and conditions. As for me, the FCC treated me well when I was in the cable business and I have confidence in them now. To conclude, I believe that if the cable, the wireless cable industry can get the programming it needs, by means of a clear signal of support from Washington, the finance and system construction will follow quickly. And by the end of the 1990s, wireless cable will have millions of subscribers. Subscribers who, if they are not satisfied, will be able for the first time in their lives to vote with their feet in choosing who provides them with cable service. 
Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Oristano. Uh, Mr. Main, we'll be happy to hear from you. Uh, Mr. Main, would you uh, please take the microphone? What are we here doing? Yes. Very good. That'll help. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. I appreciate being here. Thank you. I'm Gordon Main. I'm a home satellite system retailer, and I have, I've been actively pursuing this business personally for 10 years or better. My business is based in Lansing, Michigan, and we serve primarily the rural and agricultural areas. I'm here representing the SBCA, that is Satellite Broadcasting and Communications Association. SBCA is comprised of four segments, all having equal say and vote. These segments are dealers and distributors, manufacturers, satellite system operators, programmers, and typically have divergent viewpoints. Our membership provides over 90% of the satellite equipment and programming to the home satellite consumer. Briefly, I would like to touch upon the problem of piracy. Many retailers, myself included, have been forced to reduce our staff considerably due to the inability to compete with signal theft. Many dealers have even had to close their doors as a result of this piracy. SBCA has been the leader in the struggle to overcome this problem. I believe our industry is meeting this challenge. We have developed several programs to deal with these, and among those, General Instruments technological changes of the Video Cipher 2 Plus, SBC <coughs> anti-piracy programs, including over 30 retired FBI investigators active in the field throughout the country, and an aggressive PR program to promote the value of legal programming to the consumer. No action at this time from com uh, Congress seems necessary. We believe our industry must resolve this problem within our own ranks. The main reason I'm here as a dealer and chairman is to urge the action on the part of Congress to help our small but growing industry. C and KU band satellites has become, or if it has to become, the real competitor to cable, we must have some help. We must have help in programming, access of programming on fair and a non-discriminatory term and two, the ability to install and operate receive-only antennas without unreasonable regulations such as local zoning. The issue of pricing and distribution of programming has been the subject of considerable debate within our industry. During the last several years, Senator Gore and Representative Towson have introduced legislation which would mandate access to third-party packaging and program. We appreciate these efforts and look forward to working closely in resolving these problems. It is clearly in the best interest of the satellite dealer and the consumer. We must erase the real and perceived inequities in the pricing and the availability of program services. I would note that some programmers are serving this market with great enthusiasm. Even recently there have been some introductions of such enthusiasm. However, with respect to a number of other programming services, there appears to be considerable differences in the wholesale rates for home satellite distribution. We are seeking to establish a structure which creates a level playing field with cable, but which rec recognizes the true value of the programming services. Certain price differentials may be acceptable. Any actual and reasonable cost which a programmer incurs in serving the home satellite market, which are above those incurred for cable, should be permitted. Reasonable and bona fide volume discounts are not a problem as long as the cable operator, cable subscribers do not count towards volume discount for home satellite rates. Therefore, we urge that Congress, Congress work with our industry to resolve this issue. I would call attention to zoning. <coughs> Excuse me. It appears that a vast majority of communities have elected to ignore the FCC's preemption order. And we are thus faced with an overwhelming problem of unreasonable zoning regulation. Again, I urge Congress to consider ways in which it could help in these areas by calling upon the Commission to review and assist in the enforcement of its preemption order. Finally, an issue which has come to the forefront in recent weeks is whether or not such legislation should apply to KU Band DBS to develop in a fair and competitive marketplace. The SBCA's membership includes a number of these DBS permittees, and we have been in regular dialogue with these parties in an effort to assure the competitive development of this new delivery medium. Some legislation may be necessary to ensure that consumers enjoy the greatest benefits from this emerging technology. 
We will continue working with members of Congress on this issue. And thank you very much for the opportunity to be addressing this committee. And we're ready to answer questions as they come. Thank you, Mr. Maine. Uh, Mr. John Hendricks, we'll be happy to receive your testimony. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the subcommittee. Uh, I'm John Hendricks. I'm founder, chairman, and chief executive officer of the Discovery Channel. The Discovery Channel is a basic cable network uh, which was launched on satellite on June 17th of 1985. Uh, today we're available in uh, 50 million households across America. That's 54 percent of all Americans uh, have access to our documentary programming, which is uh, made up of science and uh, nature documentaries, as well as uh, programming on travel and world cultures. Um, I appreciate the opportunity to be here. I've been on the Senate side twice testifying. I, like the distinguished representative from Louisiana, I watched the last hearing here uh, on cable, on C-SPAN. And I want to talk about two points. And the two points are about effective and really dominant competition. Uh, in the television industry today and also talk about competition in the future and the availability of programming. On the first point, uh, the broadcasters tell two tales. One is a tale of woe that they have told in, in this hearing room about how uh, they're threatened by cable uh, television and how they are, are not of effective competition anymore. But they tell a very different story out in the real marketplace. And I've submitted in my written testimony uh, evidence of what they tell in the real world of competition. Uh, two ads, which is now making the rounds uh, on Madison Avenue, uh, it's sponsored by broadcasters. Uh, one is headline, the only thing cab on cable that's more wasted is your advertising. Uh, secondly, see if your cable TV representatives, antiperspirant works, show them this ad. Well, I'm a cable television uh, advertising representative. And this ad shows the domination that the broadcasters have in the marketplace. Cable on a 24-hour on a, uh, basis, sign on to sign off, gets a 15% share. Independent television, 25% share. ABC 19, NBC 19, CBS 19. That is dominant competition and it's competition for cable. Discovery Channel is not even mentioned. We're lumped into cable. We're about 1% share nationally. So it is effective competition. That's the state of the marketplace today. Secondly, I would just like to address the availability, availability of programming, cable programming, to other forms that are competitive to cable. Uh, I'm very proud of a recent survey that was reported in Broadcasting uh, Magazine, which is in my written testimony on page 7, which ranks the cable television services that have the highest perceived value to the consumer. Uh, rank number one is ESPN. Number two is Discovery. We have a perceived per month value of $2.25. The 15 services are list listed there that's important to any multi-channel provider. Uh, all of those ser services with exception of one, TNT, is available to any multi-channel operator. Uh, what we're here today is to talk about, I guess, the pricing of that service. And we want the ability to negotiate, and I look forward to your questions uh, on that subject. Thank you very much for having me here. Thank you, Mr. Hendricks. Uh, Mr. William Ray. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm going to tell you some things you haven't heard yet. I'm uh, with a municipally owned electric utility in South Central Kentucky. I'm here representing Glasgow, Kentucky and the American Public Power Association. I'm going to draw you an analogy about uh, the electric power business and the cable TV business that will be different than what you've heard before. The present situation in the cable television marketplace is very similar to that of electric power in the 1930s. At that time, huge private power companies sought to monopolize electricity, and at one time they did a good job of it. They had about 85 percent of all electricity generated in the United States. In response to the unscrupulous business practices of those power trusts, as they were called at that time, many communities created their own publicly owned power systems to compete with those private operators. Now that strategy worked. Prices came down, customer service got better, and the people received the benefits. The same strategy will work with cable television, but in some ways it will be even more difficult to implement. Years ago, when towns uh, sought to establish their own power companies, there was no way that the private operators could strike a deal with the forces of nature to arrange for electrons not to flow in a, private, in a publicly owned power system. The power companies never even dreamed of uh, claiming the electric wires in the consumers' homes and telling them that if they wanted to create their own power system, they'd need to rewire their house. Even they were not that ruthless. But the MSO-dominated private cable operators are. In 1988, 
city of Glasgow decided that they would begin construction of a municipally owned cable television service in direct competition with Telescript's cable company. <coughs> the desired results were again achieved. Telescripts immediately began slashing rates, upgrading technical performance, adding channels, providing local origination programming, and becoming an exemplary corporate citizen. Were it not for a couple of unexpected results, my testimony to you today would be that you only need to relax while the municipalities jump into the fray and regulate the cable television industry through real head-to-head -head competition. Unfortunately, there were a couple of problems that must be addressed before that can happen. The first barrier to municipal entry in the market is the incumbent industry's relationship with the programmers that allow them to dictate what programming will be available to new competing operators. Now, although, uh, as testimony heard earlier, most of the programmers agreed to sell to us uh, because we were a, a cable system, but a couple, in particular Turner Broadcasting Systems, refused to sell us TNT, and ESPN sells us programming with the exception of NFL football. Now, as you probably know, NFL football recently sold many of their games to ESPN and TNT. Glasgow's municipally owned system will therefore be denied access to NFL football. Now, there's no other way to access this programming, so that seems to meet the definition of a monopoly to me. A second barrier which has had a greater impact on us and which we believe is going to be even more significant in the future is the use of the existing internal wiring. Telescripts filed a suit, a lawsuit against us, to prohibit us from using the wiring inside people's homes. Now, electric service, gas, water and even the telephone companies now accept the fact that their system stops at the point their wires or plumbing enter the home. Now f for years the cable television industry maintained the same position. They didn't want to own the wire inside the house because they didn't want to pay property tax on the internal wiring. But now faced with competition for the first time they pull a new rabbit out of the hat and claim to own it all. These two examples coupled with the committee's own experience with the cable television business must surely complete the diagnosis that, exi that the existing business is an offensive monopoly growing like a <laughs> cancer on the American public that needs immediate surgery. There are scores of public power systems in the United States at the ready to commence this procedure. In order to get them started, I can only urge you, if you want to promote competition, to pass a bill with the following provisions. First of all, Programming transmitted through satellite facilities must be made available to all competitive providers of cable or wireless cable service in a community at non-discriminatory terms and conditions. Second, all wiring inside the house and the underground drop cable used in connection with cable television service, whether installed in the past or in the future, is the property of the residential owner and available for his use at his discretion to whoever he wants to buy his service from. Third, please place no restric restrictions on municipal ownership of cable television. Municipal ownership of power has done a dandy job of regulating in the past and let's not preclude it in cable television. Fourth, allow local, franchise, lo local franchising authorities to set cable rates in those communities that don't want to go eyeball to eyeball with them. And fifth, please remove the obstacles to revoking or denying renewal of a franchise when the service and rates are poor so that a municipality is not faced with multiple lawsuits when attempting to establish a competitive system. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Ray. Uh, we'll recognize now Mr. Bob Phillips of the Rural Telecommunications Cooperative. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. I'm Bob Phillips and I'm here to represent the National Rural Telecommunications Cooperative. It's a national cooperative that has 561 members who are rural electric cooperatives and rural telephone systems and we serve satellite delivered programming to over 45,000 rural Americans. Four years ago, the Congress and specifically this subcommittee had been assured that the satellite home dish would develop as a healthy industry without government intervention. In 1986, when you held your initial scrambling hearings, the cable industry told you that things were going surprisingly well. The market was working splendidly, they said. Only one decoder was all that was needed and they said that if the market was not broke, so don't try to fix it or you might break it. In 1987, you were told to have patience. Again, the market was working, it was evolving, and non-cable distribution was not needed. 
With respect to encryption, you were told that there was a human error in a sophisticated circuit and that it had been corrected and a comprehensive program to ensure the integrity of the video cipher system was in place. In 1988, then, the cable industry and cable-owned programmers told you that they didn't need third-party middlemen. They said that that might even harm consumers. It was unnecessary and premature to pass legislation. And General Instrument told you that piracy had not been solved, but their resources were squarely focused on the problem and piracy would be dramatically reduced over the next 12 to 24 months. Well, on the eve of that hearing, NRTC received some key programming distribution contracts which were brokered on the Hill and were obtained only with your support and assistance. And we thank you for that assistance because without it we would not have been able to have the opportunity to work on behalf of rural consumers who own dishes. Mr. Chairman and members of the committee, we are here today to tell you again that the home satellite dish market is not developing as an, as an affordable distribution system for rural America, nor as an effective competitor to cable. And there are some precise reasons for this marketplace failure. First, multiple competing distribution outlets that are independent of cable have not developed due to restricted access to the most popular programming. Cable controlled programmers like Viacom not only refuse to sell their own programming to the dish market through non-cable distributors, but they have even tied up other programming that they do not own, such as the Financial News Network, under exclusive contract arrangements. And as the gentleman from Glasgow indicated, Ted Turner's TNT and the NFL football this fall is not available to our 45,000 rural viewers because it is denied us as a cable exclusive product. Secondly, when programming has been made available to dish distributors, the price, the terms, and the conditions have been discriminatory when compared to cable. The wholesale price of NRTC's basic plus package of 18 scrambled channels is 460 percent higher than cable wholesale prices. In dollars and cents, NRTC is paying $10 at wholesale for those scrambled channels while a small cable operator would pay less than $2.25 for the very same programming. This pricing disparity between urban and rural programming viewers is very obvious. As an example, the programming cost for our 45,000 rural dish owners equals the programming cost to serve the cities like Denver, Atlanta, San Francisco, Seattle, Los Angeles, Dallas, Chicago, Buffalo, or Boston. And NRTC has no choice but to pass these prices, unfair as they are, on to our rural viewers. Mr. Chairman, rural dish owners and rural Americans are not getting a fair deal. As a result of programming access controlled by cable, discriminatory pricing, and marketplace confusion, home dish service is beyond the reach of the average rural consumer. All of these factors together have combined to create an environment which has fostered the illegal piracy that Mr. Maine spoke of. That piracy threatens to destroy our industry. And after the 1988 hearing, General Instruments submitted documentation to Congressman Talkie of this subcommittee advising that there were 935,000 video ciphers in service and that there had only been 378,000 of those authorized to receive programming. Today, two years later, there are approximately 1.6 million decoders in service and one million of them are not being used to obtain programming legally. Where are they? Piracy has not gotten better. The legal home dish market has not improved and this industry is continuing to flounder. And all the while, the cable industry continues to say that it is working fine. From their perspective, I suppose it has worked fine because it's not developed as a competitor. They have controlled it. The next generation of home satellite technology is KU Band <coughs> Direct Broadcast Service, which does have the potential as a universal competitor, as a universal service offering, and as competition inside of cabled areas. But it now appears that DBS will be controlled by some of the same cable entities who have stifled the development of the current home dish market. We believe Congress must act now to ensure that the current dish market <coughs> and the future DBS market technology develop to reach their full potential. We support the legislation that has been introduced by members of this subcommittee, Congressman Boucher, Congressman Cooper, and the legislation that is now being under draft consideration by Congressman Tozen. These bills recognize that access to programming at non-discriminatory prices, terms, and conditions is key to ensuring a fair and competitive marketplace. NRTC wholeheartedly supports legislation 
which seeks to make the cable industry compete with alternate delivery technologies on a level playing field. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Phillips. Uh, Mr. Winston Cox. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, much to my chagrin, in order to read my presentation, I have to put my reading glasses on. I think they're getting, my eyes are getting old. I just hope that what I have to say to you this afternoon isn't getting equally old. But here we go. Um, my name is Tony Cox, and I'm Chairman and Chief Executive Officer of Showtime Networks. And I do welcome this opportunity to share our views and update you. Showtime Networks operates two subscription pay television services, Showtime and the Movie Channel. These services are delivered to consumers through a variety of distributors, such as MMDS, SMATFI, cable operators, and cable, cable overbuilders. We also operate Showtime Satellite Networks, a packager of numerous program services for HTVRO subscribers. Showtime Networks is a subsidiary of Viacom International, a broad-based entertainment company that also owns Nickelodeon, which features award-winning children's programming, MTV, VH1, the new comedy service, Ha, as well as a 50% interest in All News Channel, a service created specifically for HTVRO subscribers. It remains our view that legislation is not warranted to regulate the fast-changing marketplace in which we operate. If enacted, legislation could have the unintended effect of harming consumer interests. To update you on developments that have occurred during the past two years in the HTVRO market, in 1988, Showtime Satellite Networks provided 15 different program services to 135,000 HTVRO subscribers. Today, we offer 29 program services to 215,000 subscribers. Two years ago, consumers had 16 sources from which to order programming. Today, consumers may order programming from 25 competing packagers. Programming is available to HTVRO consumers at prices that are equal to or lower, in most cases, than their cable subscribing neighbors. We take special pride in the startup of All News Channel, a 24-hour all news network developed with a subsidiary of Hubbard Broadcasting. All News Channel was specifically launched for the HTVRO customer this past November. And we created this channel after we were unable to agree with Turner Broadcasting on terms for our continued HTVRO distribution of CNN and headline news. Unlike others in this business who look to Congress to address their marketplace challenges, we created a new network to replace what we lost. We were and are willing to take risks to seek creative entrepreneurial solutions and not ask you to do our jobs for us. Granting third-party distribution rights by legislative mandate to those who seem unwilling to take such risks or make any financial development in the investment in the development of programming amounts to nothing more than a free ride for special interest groups who bring nothing to the table. Satellite dealers, and there are literally thousands of them, already package programming for consumers. Strategically located in the best position, that is closest to the ultimate consumer, Satellite dealers can also undercut program retailer prices by cross-subsidizing profits on equipment sales. Inserting yet another layer into the distribution channel is unnecessary and not in the consumer's interest. Third-party distributors would have to recreate the costly infrastructure of customer service and marketing systems, and higher consumer prices would result from their needless markups. In a highly competitive marketplace, success depends on customer service and goodwill. It is essential that programmers have the freedom to select who will represent their services in the market and who will deal with the consumer on their behalf to cover increasing costs and develop innovative programming, marketing, and methods of distribution. It is equally essential that programmers have the flexibility to determine the prices and, and terms on which they do business. Let me turn to the other critical issue before you today, cable rate regulation. Speaking as a programmer, Rate regulation would have an un unintended negative consequences for competition and consumer interests. With rate deregulation, we have seen the emergence of new and diverse networks and vastly improved programming. Flexibility to determine prices enables cable operators to underwrite new networks and to pay existing networks for improved programming. The consumer always lets us know when prices get too high 
relative to the value received. They simply do not buy. Yet since deregulation, consumers have continued to sign up for cable in record numbers. Finally, there has been some discussion of regulating only those programmers that are owned by, cable com by, owned by companies affiliated with cable system. The basis for this pr proposal is an assumption that companies with cable interests are solely driven by what is, quote, good for cable. This assumption is unwarranted and unrealistic. In our case, each division of our parent company, Viacom, is charged with maximizing its own revenues and determining its, determining its own strategic direction. Viacom's cable division, whose revenues are significantly lower than the revenues generated by Viacom's program services, does not dictate the policies or practices of Showtime networks. Each congressional hearing on satellite delivered programming has heard predictions that without legislation the sky would fall. Witnesses have claimed rural Americans would not have access to news or entertainment programming, incompatible decoder technologies would emerge, the dealer industry would wither and die, competing programming packages would not be available, and cable operators would prevent programmers from selling to competitive technologies. None of these predictions has come to pass. In conclusion, I would like to emphasize that we understand the legitimate issues raised at this and prior congressional hearings, and we understand the level of constituent interest in these matters. We believe, however, that these issues are being addressed by the marketplace in a pro-competitive fashion. Without legislative intervention, the marketplace on its own will continue to promote competition and, most important, consumer interests. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Cox. Uh, and the subcommittee extends its thanks to all of the witnesses for their testimony this afternoon. Uh, the chair now recognizes itself for a series of questions. Mr. Phillips, we uh, have heard this afternoon from witnesses on the previous panel that the uh, home satellite dish industry is providing today effective competition for cable TV. Uh, can you state your view of that? Yeah. Is that competition real? Does it in fact exist? Congressman, I don't believe it, it does provide any competition. In fact, I don't see how they could make that kind of claim. Uh, as I stated, um, there are, are 1.6 million decoders out there and only 650,000 are even authorized to receive programming legally. What we have created is marketplace confusion, a market that's controlled by cable and cable programmers, a marketplace that does not have access to programming uh, on equal terms and conditions, and pricing that's fair. And so what we have is, is an incentive to, to uh, ruin the market and, in effect, create piracy. We're now in a second round of, of decoders from General Instrument and there's more confusion brought on by that and higher prices for the decoder, I might add. And I don't see the dish as competition to cable at all. And the biggest reason for that, if I understand your statement, is that pricing of the cable-affiliated programming to the home dish market is not fair, uh, it's discriminatory, and that prevents the home dish market from being an effective competitor. That's correct. The, the pricing is, has uh, created an incentive, if you will, to pirate. Uh, Mr. Cox just stated that consumers don't buy when prices are too high. And I think that's true. They don't. And in the rural market, in the satellite dish market, unfortunately, it's driven the marketplace by incentives to pirate the units. Your testimony uh, set forth a, a very revealing item of evidence concerning the unfairness of pricing. Uh, I was somewhat taken aback by the uh, magnitude of the difference between what you have to pay to get certain cable affiliated programs and, and what a small cable company has to pay. Now both of you are buying those programs on the wholesale level. Uh, I can imagine some difference in charge if the sale is being made directly from the programming source to the home dish owner uh, himself because there probably is some incremental cost that's associated with making that sale. But I wonder if you could tell us whether there's any incremental cost to the programmer in making a sale to you as a third-party packager. Congressman, it's our belief that there is essentially no incremental sale to deal with NRTC as a wholesale distributor when compared to dis dealing with a cable operator. NRTC has made the investment, as Mr. Cox indicated, in back office facilities, computer facilities. We have a link to the General Instrument DBS Center. We solicit customers, we market customers, we turn their boxes on or off, and we provide one bill to the programmer for all the services each month. 
So there really is no incremental cost to the programmer. And yet you're having to pay roughly four times as much as the cable system is paying for the same program at the wholesale level. That's correct. On average, we pay 460 percent. It goes all the way up to 780 percent. Let me just ask you this, Mr. Phillips. I, I know you must have had discussions with the programmers who are charging you that extraordinary uh, uh, differential. Uh, do they have any justification for that? What's their response? Some programmers indicate to us that, well, it's a different market and it's a different opportunity and there's less uh, opportunities in rural areas for viewing and uh, so it's worth more. And others have indicated, well, there are costs and they don't delineate or identify what those costs are. But we get very general answers like that. Is there anyone on the panel who would like to try to justify this differential? Uh, Mr. Hendricks. I would, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Hendricks. Um, the marketplace has determined a price uh, for a multi-channel service. Uh, in cable, it's around $15. Uh, there is a cost by, that any distributor incurs in delivering that. Uh, cable, uh, the cable operators generally spend between $1,000 and $1,200 in provide, getting a hard wire to the home. Uh, Tony Cox with Showtime, he has a very different cost structure. So all of this boils down to just negotiations on the profit that's made. For instance, with a cable operator, he may charge $15 and his profit may be $5. So there may be a different rate than maybe uh, Mr. Cox's rate with the Showtime package. He may be making $10. Now, shouldn't I be able to charge him more? Well, we had a series of negotiations with Tony Cox. I think of him as a third-party distributor. I have nothing to do with his, his company, Viacom. And he pays a rate that's three times what our cable, average cable rate is. And that's just as a result of negotiations. You know, what you, we have here are some people uh, who want you to negotiate for them. And it would be great. It would be a great business proposition to have a uniform rate, especially when there's different costs at the distribution end. Well, I understand that you're effectively trying to charge what the market will bear. But uh, given your monopoly position, your total control over the programming, the fact that you're making that kind of differential charge uh, four times as much for a third-party packager as for a cable system really means that the satellite dish industry is a less effective competitor. And uh, I think we all want to see broader competition. Maybe one way to get at that is to provide for uniform rates, fair and non-discriminatory rates for third-party packagers. Mr. Phillips, did you want to comment again? I just wanted to comment, uh, Congressman, that the, the argument was made about the cost of plant to get to the customer's home. In many locations, the electric co-ops are providing satellite dishes installed on leasing plans so that it's a monthly cost to the customer. And we make the investment, and we still don't get any credit for the delivery system. Mr. Phillips, I'd, I'd like to ask, uh, if you would, to provide documentation to the subcommittee that details these differential rates that we've been discussing uh, and uh, sets forth uh, the rate that uh, is charged to the cable company and then the rate that you're having to pay on the wholesale level. If you would do that, that would be very helpful. I can, I can provide that in lump, uh, Congressman. I'm uh, restricted from giving you exact numbers because of confidentiality clauses that were a subject of negotiation as well in those agreements. Provide as much information as your contracts allow, if you will. I will. Mr. Cox, did you want to comment? Uh, Mr. Chairman, just two, two things to add to the previous dialogue. Um, I can't speak for other program services, but in the case of Showtime, um, there, are ca there, are the prices that there are cable operators who pay a higher wholesale rate to us than many of our SMA TV or MMDS or TVRO packagers pay. Uh, so these markups that you're hearing are not true as it relates to uh, the subscription pay services like Showtime. And secondly, I really don't think that the, the, the price differential that, that Mr. Phillips is suggesting that he is paying versus cable operators is the reason why the backyard dish business hasn't flourished. I mean, you just need to look to my left and to your right and see that big clunker that's sitting there. And that is, that is a part of the reason why uh, this business isn't flourishing. It's expensive. It's awkward. It's hard to install, particularly for those of us who don't live on large pa patches of land. And there's an, an awful lot of reasons why the direct to the home business uh, is is been slow to start. But relative to where it's been, I'm quite pleased with the progress we're making. And I think when we see developments like that that, that very very small dish uh, sitting on the desk there, I think we can anticipate a rapid expansion of the direct to the home business. Well, I for one very much hope that that prediction is accurate. Uh, Mr. Ray, I have just a couple of questions of you. 
Uh, you are representing a municipality which uh, operates a cable television company, is that correct? That's correct. Uh, is there another cable provider in your municipality? Yes, there is. Telescope's so, Cable Company. And so you're involved in head-on-head -head competition with another provider. Yes. Are you having difficulty getting access to programming? Well, as I stated, we had uh, a lot of difficulty, but we, we eventually got all except uh, TNT and NFL football on ESPN. Uh, many of the providers, uh, the programming providers, had the attitude uh, that, hey, if, if one of our affiliates is getting overbuilt, that's expensive to do, they must have deserved it. And, and they sell this program without any problem. Others that were more uh, closely aligned with, uh, with the MSOs drug their feet and over a term of four or five months uh, threatening <laughs> lawsuits going in the other direction, we finally did get most of them to acquiesce and, and are delivering us programming, with the exception of TNT and NFL football. Thank you, Mr. Ray. Uh, the chair's time has expired. Uh, the chair now recognizes the uh, gentleman from Louisiana, Mr. Tozen. Mr. Cox, I'll have you know, sir, that that clunker is as beautiful to a <laughs> rural American as his pick em up truck and his rifle and the back seat in the rack. And they love him. And they love him because it does for them what your cable does for a lot of other places in America. It brings them your programming when you're willing to sell it to people. In fact, I don't know if we're alive or on Memorex today, but Bob Kopnick of Crockett, Texas, just called in to say he had a Tandy Dish 1990 model for sale for $1,997, $1,496 installed and guaranteed. If, if anybody's interested, I just told him I'd pass it on. <coughs> Bottom line is that um, for rural Americans who don't have cable access, and for some who do, and who do have space to put a dish in the yards, on their ranches, on their farms, what we're learning today reemphasizes what we've been learning for many years. That is that rural Americans are being discriminated against. And if you want to sense the frustration of rural Americans who want the same kind of services that are provided to people on cable, read, please, the entire testimony of the NRTC and Bob Phillips. I mean, Mr. Cox, you won't even sell him Turner's TNT, which carries the NFL package soon, portions of the Olympics. You won't even sell him your Showtime. You won't sell him the movie channel. You won't sell him MTV. My God, that would be sinful. You won't sell him VH1 and the Financial News Network. But why not? Why won't you sell that to the only real legitimate third-party packager in America that's serving 45,000 customers that are ready to buy your program if you sell it to them? Why won't you do it? I, I think the answer is simple. He's a competitor. I'm interested in delivering my product to the consumer, and, and I believe that we're doing a very, very effective job of providing our networks to every, every home TV satellite owner who wants to get it. Uh, I don't think we need Mr. Phillips uh, to make that happen. Mr. Cox, he's not a competitor if he can't sell the product. He's not a competitor at all. He's out of the game. I mean, you're, you're alone selling those programs to Americans, and if, if I'm in the country and I'd like to see the NFL package, I don't have a choice, do I? I got to call you up once uh, TNT is carrying you, right? Right. Call me. That's the point. I don't have a choice. Where is the competitor? Secondly, if you want to sense the level of frustration, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, read further on. NRTC says in its testimony that it's it's pleased with the progress it made at the FCC. Listen to this progress. The commission announced it was, quote, disturbed by evidence of wholesale price discrimination by satellite carriers against NRTC by as much as 500 to 800 percent. It was disturbed. That's the progress we've made in all these years. We've got somebody disturbed at the FCC. Our rural Americans every year are paying four, 500, 800 times as much for the same wholesale pricing that is provided for others in America <laughs> We happen to be lucky enough to be on a, on a, on a cable. I'm a fan of cable, Mr. Kai, I really am. 
but like a fan of a good rock singer, every now and then I see an album I just don't like, and I'm hearing some music today I don't like. And the music I'm hearing is that after the commission says it's disturbed and it's going to investigate 500 percent price discriminations against the only third-party distributor for America's rural customers, TCI comes along and offers them a contract after the commission makes this finding. And guess what? It says you can have our superstation, TBS, if you give us 800 percent over the wholesale price provided for cable cable subscribers. That's after the commission said it was disturbed. Obviously, the disturbance of the commission hadn't disturbed anybody at TCI. <laughs> My point is that so long as we're in this position and so long as Congress fails to do something to ensure that the program that you do provide, and it's good stuff, I love it, I love that Discovery Channel. Absolutely love it. The program that Americans love is not being made available at all to some of the distributors, or when it is made available, it's made available at these kind of price discriminations, then you're automatically making second-class citizens out of a whole range of Americans out there. You're saying, you can have it, but we're going to make you pay through the nose for it. That's not the kind of competition I think this panel is interested in seeing develop in this area. It's why we're drafting again. It's why I'll be offering again very soon, probably next week, legislation to try to set some policy here to make sure that third-party distributors have a shot of getting that programming at fair prices so that no American is discriminated against. See, I'm not terribly concerned about the discrimination against the distributor. It's that consumer at the end who gets burned. What bothers me, and it ought to bother the commission more than just disturb them. They ought to do more than investigate, and we ought to do more than have hearings. We ought to pass some legislation ensuring that that customer out in rural America who happens to love the looks of that clunker, and who's going to love the looks of that streamlined clunker, will have a chance to buy that programming at fair rates. That's all. No big deal. It doesn't mean you go out of business. It just means it's competition. It just means you're all, you're all uh, out there <laughs> hustling the same customer, the way everybody else does in America, where there's no monopoly. Could I respond? Yeah, please. Um, just two thoughts. One, I think, to clarify what I think is some confusion, but I frankly wish I did live in rural America when I look at Orbit magazine and see the incredible number of, of options that the, uh, the, the dish owner has, over 200 choices uh, to pull down from the satellite. I was looking at, it looked like a virtual telephone directory of sports offerings in the month of March uh, that the dish owner had available to them. Um, those of us who have access to uh, satellite programming only through cable are, are obviously being denied uh, some programming choices that the folks in rural America with, with dishes and access to the satellite well, marketplace you, you, have you enormous make, Well, advantage. you helped me in my case, and I'm, I'm glad you did that because you, you, you knocked that clunker so hard it almost fell off the, off the floor. It's just if you, only, if you have a sixteenth of an acre, that's, that's the problem. Well, that's you know, the, the, the testimony uh, here today is that if, with a, a few changes at the FCC, we could have four-foot dish right now available. Uh, and I hope a smaller not only Not only rural Americans, but urban Americans yes. could have them in their backyards just as well. If we had a little help from somebody at, at the FCC, if we had a little help from Congress, we could have some guaranteed availability of, of all the range of programming at fair prices. And hopefully the price then, for dishes will come down. And the price would come down for everybody. You and in, in your urban setting, wherever it may be, Mr. Cox, <laughs> and I don't know, I apologize, would, would have a right, if we didn't have zoning ordinance that didn't let you, and if we had an FCC that was cooperative and allowed the right spacing, if we had a Congress that provided the right kind of policy, You'd have that right too, and very soon, hopefully, you'll have a right to put something even less obtrusive uh, on your on your house or in your home, and get the same choice of programming that Orbit Magazine uh, illustrates is is available where it is available. I hope so. In the, other, the other point I wanted to make, which I think is some confusion, is that the consumer. We're talking about the consumer. We're not talking about the NRTC or Showtime satellite exactly. networks. We're talking about the consumer, the consumer who has a dish is paying less for Showtime 
and the, his cable subscribing neighbor right next door, uh, I think, is cable as, as subscribing Mr. neighbor didn't have to buy the dish and the equipment. Cable company bought it for him and is providing it for him. And if the satellite home dish owner is to amortize the cost of the equipment he has to purchase to, to get a competitive offering, along with the cost of the services marked up 400 and 800 percent on occasion, you see that there's some awful discrimination going on. I'm glad the FCC is disturbed. I hope enough members of this subcommittee gets disturbed so we do something about it this year. And folks who are out there struggling, like Mr. Maines and the business, and those of you who are programmers, who I believe have a great interest in seeing the development of, of home satellite uh, industry. I think you know yourself, Showtime makes a lot of its profit off of its distribution. It's a good business there. And if all of you had the chance to compete fairly, that consumer that you just talked about would have a fair shot instead of being discriminated in the total cost of the service, amortized equipment as well as cost of programming. And that's what bothers me and bothers so many people here. Well, by the way, Congressman, as a packager, we are paying those kind of marked up prices uh, to, the, to the, the, the services that we carry the same as, as these folks are. Um, and we're making a go of it. Well, that's not, to me, that's not the difference between uh, our being successful well, or not why, being successful. Why wouldn't you make a go of it if, if you're carrying the same prices that he's having to carry to the same group of Americans? Uh, they'd, of course. But just think if you offered him competitive prices as you offer the cable, you'd probably have to lower your wholesale prices from, from Showtime uh, to, your, to your satellite distribution system. And those Americans would probably get a better deal from both of you and have a fairer choice, wouldn't they? Uh, if, if, if the cable per subscriber is paying $10 and the dish owner is paying 9 I'm not sure that I accept your contention that they're being He's paying 9 this. plus the cost of his equipment. My that's point. their choice, yes. Well, th that's, that's the problem. And for which they get over 200 different channels. I mean, you but cannot the, forget the options. No, that I, that I don't forget that. And that's why I keep promoting it as a good option for Americans, rural and urban. But the point I make to you is, is that so long as you are operating in a, in a marketplace where the customer base has to decide between two people whose wholesale prices are determined by you, then that's not real fair competition. Neither is that fair to that customer base. I made the point. The point is, I guess finally, that, that there's something wrong with the telecommunications system in America that says to some Americans, who have no choice but to use a satellite dish, and others who would like to choose the satellite dish because they don't like the way they're being treated by the cable company, that you have to do it at great cost. You can't do it in a fair, competitive world. And I think we can cure that if we want to here in this Congress with one simple little piece of legislation. And if we do it right, it'll open the door to that technology too. I'll be asking this committee to consider it. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, could the, I make uh, one comment? Well, the time of the gentleman has expired. Uh, the chair now recognizes the gentleman from Massachusetts, the chairman of the subcommittee, Mr. Markey. I thank the uh, chair very much. Um, clearly, we have a number of issues that are on the table simultaneously, and I don't think that we can get a full sense of what's happening out there unless we think of it as an integrated uh, set of uh, subject materials that uh, have to be uh, thought of simultaneously rather than in part because I don't think there is any single fix to the problems that exist in the uh, <coughs> cable uh, marketplace today. Uh, if we are to deal with it, I think we have to look at a range of issues simultaneously and try to insert them all where appropriate. Uh, and realize that uh, no combination actually does solve the problem of each region of the country or each part of the, of the problem itself. And that will be the job of the subcommittee in the course of this year, to try to sort through that mix of, of uh, issues and then the uh, mix of solutions so that we can tailor things that make some uh, sense. One of the questions which I think will be raised is the extent to which the nascent uh, satellite dish industry, <clears throat> the satellite <coughs> industry generally, should be protected from uh, cable or uh, broadcast industry domination. Um, should we have cross-ownership 
uh, <coughs> protections here uh, so that the, the broadcasting and uh, uh, cable industries don't move into this new uh, area in a way that uh, allows them to dominate what could be a major competitor. Uh, that is, and to put it quite simply, in the same way that we put restrictions on broadcasters and telephone companies in terms of their ability to move into the cable industry so that we would have a, a separate uh, new industry which was developed under independent ownership, should we have that same type of protection now put on the books uh, for this uh, new industry uh, as it now begins to emerge uh, in uh, the United States of America. Uh, do any of you wish to respond to that, to give a... Uh... Uh, Mr. Markey, uh, I'd also uh, ask you to include wireless in those cross-ownership restriction right, well, comments. Well, I think... Well, uh, well uh, or, then let's include wireless mm -hmm. and now deal with it as a cross-ownership question. I broadly. believe that if the cable operator in a given area is allowed to buy or lease wireless frequencies, his natural inclination will be to warehouse them or certainly not to use them to compete effectively with themselves. So we would be very much in support of cross ownership restrictions. Mr. Cox, you know how success you know how important those cross ownership <coughs> rules were to the development of the cable industry. Do you feel that they would be appropriate as well now for the satellite industry? Yeah, I that's that's less of an issue to me, if you will, because as a programmer, um, I think as a programmer, it's less of an issue. I think the, the prior panel to this were all different technologies, if you will, asking for your permission to go and compete uh, in the programming marketplace. I mean, it's, it's nice to be loved. I guess we're the ones that are wanted. And some of the folks here sitting at the table have technologies that they, they think uh, can get in the marketplace and do quite well. Um, and, and I think the, the point here, I have two points to make. It's interesting that uh, people in this room, including members of the committee, suggest that we <laughs> prefer not regulating this industry. And the way to avoid regulation, of course, is to open it up to competition. Um, and you heard the telephone company representatives and everybody talking about that. But the interesting thing is that in order to avoid regulation of the various technologies, be it cable or telco, we're, we're, we're going to turn around and regulate the programmers. Um, which I find, uh, unfortunately, as a programmer, that I'm bearing that well, brunt. Let's, let's tease out that question okay. and just go to the question that I asked you. Since you don't have a dog in that fight, you might be able to give us a yeah. I, you know, if if impartial view. If you can look upon high-power DBS as perhaps a better mousetrap than coaxial cable, <clears> it seems to me that when that better mousetrap comes along, it will replace. Or, if, or obsolete uh, the, the earlier generation of distribution, if you will. And, and I'm not sure that it makes sense to take the, the pioneers of one uh, generation of technology distribution and say, you cannot go in to advance to the next generation. I was sitting here trying to think of an analogy that the black and white TV set manufacturers couldn't uh, manufacture color TV sets. Um, I, I think that if, if, if the, the cable operators as distributing a video distributors of video and information technology to the home can find a, a, a better, cheaper way to do it, uh, we, ought to, we ought to applaud that. I'm sure that the telephone companies would think that uh, cable television was just a further advance on the information service that they had provided earlier and that eventually the technology would be understood to just be a further maturation of an earlier telecommunications technology. But nonetheless, the decision was made to separate them so you would have a vigorous new competitive industry. Mr. Phillips, could we get your comments on the need to uh, have cross-ownership rules? Yes, Mr. Chairman. It seems to me that we're interested here in developing a competitor or multiple competitors to cable, and we're also interested in providing universal service in the areas beyond the reach. NRTC is interested most in providing service beyond the reach of cable, and we, in our experience, know that access to programming and fair pricing for that is essential. We also think, because of our experience and looking at the historical perspective of cross-ownership restrictions, that you ought to consider those and they ought to be part of the debate. We have certainly suggested that we would uh, favor that kind of approach. Okay. Any other? Mr. Hendricks? Yes. I want to second, by the way, Mr. Tozan's uh, compliments to you on the quality of your uh, discovery channel. Thank I think you it's very excellent. Much. Well, uh, we are a vertically integrated <laughs> service. Uh, discovery channel is uh, majority owned by four cable operators. 
Uh, we, but we provide our service on a non-discriminatory basis uh, to uh, technologies that are competitive with cable. And with uh, the microband MMDS, um, it's a, the operators pay on uh, the same basis as do uh, cable operators. Uh, we think the marketplace is working. Again, the dominant competition <coughs> is the broadcasters. Cable, by your generosity through the Cable Act, we've got a 15 share. Uh, we're just trying to preserve that and make money in other markets. Uh, one of those is the backyard market. And again, I think the debate is over the wholesale price. Uh, again, if the Discovery Channel increases its rate by 400 percent, it's like going from 7 cents to 28 cents. So that's the real increase. And if, that's, if there's 10 networks charging that, that's $2.80. And I see what the third party distributors are, are selling their service for. So it's just, it really is a debate over who gets that excess profit. Could you tell us what the uh, structure is of the ownership of the Discovery uh, Channel? Uh, yes, the 97 percent is owned by the four cable operators. Uh, TCI owns 34 uh, percent, 14 percent is owned by United Artists Entertainment, 24 uh, percent by Cox, um, and 24 percent by Newhouse. And the balance is uh, owned by myself. Okay. And what was the, um, uh, the origination of the, of the channel? Who were the, were the cable um, owners the original investors, although was, a, was no, there another I'm, set initially that then were supplanted by the no, cable? I'm, I'm the founder of the network. I incorporated in 1982, uh, did the business plan in 83, raised initial financing from venture capitalists, New York Life Insurance Company, Allen & Company, and Group W Satellite Communications. Okay, and at what point did you uh, uh, sell to the cable? A year ago. A year ago, the venture capitalists sold their interest to the cable operators. And what was the um, basis for your a sale at that particular point in time, beyond the, the well, normal the maturation wanted, of a venture right. capital uh, uh, investment. The, the venture capitalists had participated at an early stage, and so it was an opportunity for them to, to convert their stock into cash, and they made would, a profit. Would you prefer to have retained ownership yourself? Uh, no, I've had an extremely good experience with the cable operators. Uh, when nobody else would in invest in, uh, in the Discovery Channel, we had $5 million in startup capital. It wasn't enough to do the job. Uh, I unfortunately launched a little bit early in 1985 when the industry was regulated, and cable operators could not afford to pay for a new service. We had to go on free and try to survive on advertising revenue, which doesn't materialize for a cable network until you get to 14 million homes and are metered by Nielsen. So we had no revenue stream. Mm -hmm. So um, it was only by deregulation that the cable operators had the ability to pay uh, a, a fee, and then we, exi we exist because of the cable industry. I yield to the gentleman from uh, Louisiana. I, th I think, uh, the Chair, I, I, just one point, Mr. Hendricks, you and someone else in the cable industry made the same point earlier about uh, the networks having an 85 percent uh, <laughs> share. Uh, with network programming on the cable package and the rest of cable programming have, having 15 percent. But you do resell the network programming, don't you? I, I don't. Mean, well, I'm, uh, you're talking I mean, about the cable operators. Cable operators, isn't that true? Yes, it's part of the basic package. Yeah. Uh, so. They do offer the, the local broadcasters or broadcasting just, signals as well as the satellite well, delivery services. I just services. want the record to reflect that. Cable is not operating on 15% share. It's also reselling the network programs that are already purchased with the advertising revenues. So there's a double, there's a resale there of that 85 percent share and that's part of, that's a very important part, is it not, of the cable programming? It is important. The point that's to be made is that the demand by the consumer is still overwhelming uh, for broadcast television, which serves as a check on uh, basic cable rates. No, I, that, that's a good point. I just didn't want the, anyone to leave with the impression that cable was operating on profits made from only a 15 percent share of the audience. You, you're actually earning a, a, a good basic uh, revenue, a cable is, from, from the uh, resale of the network signals under the compulsory license. You get it for free and you resell it. That's the cable operators. The cable networks, the basic cable networks survive on two streams of revenue. One is advertising, which is tough on 15% yep. share, and for the case of one network, a one share. Right. And then what we have to depend on for our existence and growth is the license fee that the cable operator right. pays us. Right. And the that's why we're so threatened by regulation. Right. Because the cable if operator, on the other hand, has, <coughs> has that additional revenue stream coming from the sale of network programming, which he gets for free because Congress provided a, a compulsory license, a free license to 
take it, retransmit it, and sell it. It's an exchange. It's the value added to the broadcasters. Right. I, I reclaim my time, and I'd just like to follow up on this because the, sometimes the history of the evolution of these industries is, uh, is lost in the far distant uh, mist of the past. Um, in fact, there was a, a fairly fundamental decision made that uh, under the compulsory licensing uh, laws that were passed that uh, broadcasters would have to, in effect, donate their uh, programming to the cable uh, industry uh, because of a public policy decision which we made uh, that we wanted to uh, nurture this young industry. And, uh, and then, later, uh, we decided that we would look at those television uh, local stations as the competitors to the industry, which had now been created largely uh, on the back of those uh, free over-the-air stations. Um, and I guess that's why, uh, to some extent, uh, looking at the new technologies that we've displayed here today, um, I think that it may be appropriate for us to look at some type of formula that does ensure that uh, the, uh, the newer industries, uh, the, uh, the further advancement of the technology and the means of, of ensuring access of programming to homes across this country, we cannot forget that only 56% of the homes in this country uh, now have access, now uh, use cable, um, to ensure that we do uh, find the most effective and expeditious way of accomplishing that goal while protecting consumers and ratepayers. Dylan, yield again. I'm glad to yield. And he's made the point. I mean, well, I'm giving you a speech. I know. So, uh, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I just wanted to punctuate it. It's, it's, it's ironic, isn't it, that Congress made a decision <clears throat> to give cable a chance to grow and to reach out uh, to Americans to make the networks provide their signal free of charge to the cable. And we're hearing today now that the cable programmers are complaining when they have to sell because we're telling them they ought to, they ought to have to sell, not give it away free. They ought to, they ought to have to sell it on a non-discriminatory basis uh, to these new technologies that are ready to distribute to Americans. Isn't it ironic? I mean, we were awful good to the cable companies. We still are. We still maintain the Cable Act with its deregula deregulation features. And it's ironic now that this industry, now grown strong and viable and healthy and, and absolutely beautiful, is now unwilling not to give their programming away, but unwilling to even sell it at non-discriminatory pricing. Come on, guys. I mean, in the time we, uh, we, we deal fairly with the consumer at the tail end. Thank you. I, yield, I, uh, I reclaim my time once again, and just to, in, in conclusion, uh, make this point. Um, <laughs> It would be that as we proceed this year, it is the full intention of the subcommittee to be fair to all parties involved, uh, whether it be a satellite or microwave, whether it be the cable or television or, or, uh, or, uh, or uh, telephone uh, industries in this country. We intend to create a climate here which will make it possible for a, a fair resolution of all these issues. But we have to remember as we're going through these proceedings that there's ultimately one interest that we have to ensure that fairness is provided, and that is the consumer in the country. And we'll try to use that as our bottom uh, line guide as we go through these proceedings. And we're going to need the cooperation of all of the parties as we come back and really review the Cable Act of 1984, its benefits, which have been considerable, and I think we're all willing to stipulate that we're big fans of cable. We, uh, it's changed the lives of uh, uh, tens of millions of Americans, but at the same time un uh, understand that there were unintended consequences and unforeseen circumstances that have now interjected themselves into the mix. And we have to accommodate those. And we have to come back and reformulate the equation in a way that does ensure that in the end the consumers are deriving all of the benefits from this wonderful technological revolution which is taking place uh, in this country and around the world. And our committee is committed this year to achieving that goal, and I want to thank all of the witnesses for their participation today. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The gentleman's time has expired. The chair thanks the witnesses for their presentation today, and uh, there being no further business before the subcommittee, it stands adjourned.
Good day from the nation's capital. You're watching C-SPAN. We'd like to take a short break to bring you an update of our program schedule for the next several hours. But first, this reminder on Saturday at 1 p.m. Eastern Time.